Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, I'm Michael Widmer, Belmont Town Moderator. Um, and I wanna thank you very much for joining us tonight. We have a uh, way more than a quorum and uh, we very much appreciate your attendance at this meeting and your patience. Uh, I would like officially to open the annual town meeting, the annual town meeting for 2020 for the town of Belmont. Let me give a little context here. In mid-March, we were uh, organizing for our traditional town meeting with segment A and segment B. And then of course the pandemic hit. Uh, like every other town and city in the state, we had to scramble to figure out how were we going to meet our obligations, our legislative obligations, principally passing a town budget in the middle of a pandemic. So a variety of towns have tried different alternatives, but there were a small group, including outdoor uh, football fields and, and field houses and so forth. A small group of towns, including Belmont, decided we wanted to do a virtual town meeting. We felt our town leaders that that was the safest way to proceed. So we began an effort which first included getting legislative permission to do that. The current law or the prior law was silent on uh, virtual town meetings because that hadn't really been considered of course when the legislation was passed. It was silent, so we thought we might have had the authority to proceed with a virtual meeting, but we all felt that it was better if we could get legislation passed. So we collaborated with a number of towns, about half a dozen other communities, and then more communities subsequently weighed in. George Hall, our town council, Senator Will Brownsberger, Representative Dave Rogers, town leaders um, worked hard on putting together legislation. And about two to three weeks ago, it was approved, which gives us the authority to proceed with a virtual town meeting. But that was only one small piece of what we had to do. Uh, as you're well aware, this was a logistical enterprise of Herculean proportions to try to organize a virtual town meeting and get some 300 people conversant with the technology, particular Zoom and turning technologies. So we set about this effort, uh, and I would like to recognize in particular uh, Ellen Cushman and the town clerk staff, Dave Petto and the IT staff, Jeff Hansel uh, and Belmont Media, and uh, Patrice Garvin and the town administrator staff for all their amazing work. Uh, there were 44 training sessions alone. And honestly, that was only a tip of the iceberg in terms of the amount of effort that it's taken to put this meeting together. Uh, I was going to say in my opening remarks that inevitably we'll have some glitches. Well, we already have, and you've been patient, and we very much appreciate that. Uh, I also want to thank the uh, efforts of our town leaders, the select board, the warrant committee, the capital budget committee, community preservation committee, who as they do for all town meetings, have to uh, really uh, make a major, major effort to not only of course vote on issues and, uh, and understand them, but then communicate them in intelligent and cogent ways to town meeting members. Um, so this has taken a major effort, but I have to say I'm enormously pleased that we're here tonight doing this. Of all the towns in Massachusetts, there are only about seven or eight uh, towns who are doing virtual town meetings. So Belmont is at the forefront of this effort, and I'm very pleased about that, and I hope you are as well. Now, traditionally, at the beginning of the meetings, we stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, tonight, 
I will say the pledge and I will simply ask you, each of you to keep your, um, stay mute and uh, recite the pledge quietly. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I now in a moment wanna have a moment of silence. Um, to say the least, uh, this is a, uh, one of the more difficult times in um, not only our nation's history, but in the history of this planet. And uh, you know, the COVID pandemic in particular, uh, it's cut a wide swath through the globe, caused immeasurable suffering and pain. We've lost 60 lives here in Belmont, some 7,500 in Massachusetts, more than 100,000 in the US, almost half a million across the world. And then those families and relatives and friends of all the people lost. And then many of those who suffered the virus and survived have come out with complications and may last years or a lifetime. So there's a lot of suffering. And the other thing that's going on, of course, is uh, violence uh, and one sort or another. And um, that has struck a deep chord in our nation. So I would like to just have us take a moment of silence for all those who have suffered through the COVID and for the victims of violence everywhere. Thank you very much. I'd now like to have a special report, maybe a brief report of about five minutes from Wes Chin, who is Director of Public Health for the Town of Belmont, so he can bring us up to date on uh, the COVID and where things stand. So I would recognize Mr. Chin. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Great. So this evening I was asked to provide town meeting with a brief update on the state of COVID in Belmont. However, before I begin, I want to publicly acknowledge the hard work and dedication of many of my colleagues here in town hall. Over the past three months, we have worked tirelessly together to come up with a local response to COVID. We have done a lot of learning on the fly as there have been a lot of questions and unknowns with respect to how best to respond to this novel virus on a community level. However, we here in the health department have also been fortunate to work side by side with um, many dedicated leaders and staff in the town. And in particular, I just wanna thank the select board, board of health, town administration, schools, police, fire, facilities, recreation, town clerk's office, community development, HR, senior center, and IT, who have worked tirelessly side by side with us to help interpret and make sense of, at times, seemingly confusing and often changing advice that we receive from DPH and CDC. So moving on to my brief update here, um, I'd like to let you all know that it appears that the number of COVID positive cases throughout the state and in Belmont has started to slow down. This indicates to us that our collective efforts to abide by the governor's stay at home order have been successful in slowing down the spread and transmission of the virus. We are ca cautiously, cautiously optimistic and hopeful that this trend will continue as reopening slowly and thoughtfully begins. However, it is important for all of us not to let our guard down during this time. When it comes to social distancing, wearing face masks and the frequent 
washing of hands will be very important as we move forward. So I know there have been some questions in the community about who this virus has impacted the most in Belmont. Our hope is over the next seven to 10 days to break down this information that we have and to be able to share it with the community on the town's COVID webpage. As a bit of a preview, I can share with you that approximately two thirds of our 229 confirmed positive COVID cases were not associated with a group home setting. However, approximately 90% of the deaths that we experienced in Belmont were related to a congregate living situation. The age of people most affected by COVID in the community ranged between the ages of 50 to 70. They accounted for roughly a third of all of our positive cases. Our youngest case was 15 and our oldest was 100. The breakdown by gender, we had 145 females that tested positive, which represents 64% of all positives. Males accounted for 36%. Um, the only thing, the final thing I'd like to add is again, we're, we try to post weekly updates with relevant information about COVID and the town's response to it on the homepage. Um, I'd encourage everybody to, to check out this, that information we post. We try to make it relevant and useful. And if you have any questions, you're always welcome to reach out to the health department and we'll try our best to answer your questions. And if we don't have an answer, we'll work hard to find one for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chin. And I appreciate all the work that you and other town staff and leaders have done. And on behalf of town meeting, I want to thank you very much. We now turn, as I normally do, uh, on the procedures that we're going to follow tonight. Uh, they will closely uh, track what we do at a in-person town meeting, but let me review some of them uh, briefly uh, because they are obviously different uh, when we're remote. Uh, in terms of speaking, when I open a motion for discussion, town meeting members wishing to speak should raise his or her hand through the raise hand feature. I will recognize you in the order that you raise your hand. I'm working with Ellen Cushman here on my right to track the order and to try to make sure we do this fairly and move the process along. When I recognize you, please unmute the audio and state your name and precinct. The meeting is being recorded and the court reporter will be pre preparing a transcript. So please speak clearly and slowly. And as I've indicated in my communications prior to the meeting, for this meeting only, we ask that you keep your remarks to three minutes. All votes tonight will be by roll call, except in a couple of instances where I will ask for unanimous consent. We will show the voting results briefly during the meeting, and they will be available online through the town clerk's office. Admitting to the floor beyond the town meeting members are follows. The town administrator, department heads and staff, the town clerk staff, town council George Hall, the warrant committee, capital budget committee, the superintendent of schools, the school committee and staff, community preservation committee, the Belmont Housing Trust and the library trustees. At this point, I would like to recognize Ellen Cushman. She will provide a few additional details and do the reading of the warrant. Ellen. Good evening, everyone. Pursuant to the warrant for the annual town meeting to be held June 16, 2020, I, Ellen O'Brien Cushman, town clerk, do hereby certify that I gave notice of said meeting 
by posting an attested copy of the warrant and the moderator letter to the select board requesting the town meeting be held by remote participation on the town clerk's official bulletin board in town hall on the town website and at least five other places in town seven days before the date of this meeting in accordance with chapter 39 section 10 of the general laws and section 30-110a of the general bylaws of the town of Belmont. Furthermore, I do hereby certify that I gave notice of the annual town meeting of June 16, 2020 by causing a copy of the warrant and the moderator letter to the select board requesting the town meeting be held by remote participation to be sent to the town meeting members at least seven days before the date of this meeting and by causing copies of the warrant to be made available via the public library and the town clerk's office and on the town's website all in accordance with section 30-110B of the general bylaws of the town of Belmont and the representative town meeting acts of 1926 as amended. Moderator Mike Widmer has asked me to briefly review a few key points regarding the technology you will be using tonight for our virtual and remote access town meeting. Town meeting members, presenters, and some town employees are the only people in the Zoom webinar. Members of the general public are most welcome to watch on www.belmontmedia.org or on the community access television station, channel eight for Comcast or 28 for Verizon. This town meeting is being televised on Belmont Media. For town meeting members voting at home who are watching the cable television broadcast instead of being on Zoom, there may be a slight delay in what you see on your television, but your turning point account will open at the same time as everyone else for voting. Town meeting members should have already set up their turning point accounts. Turning point again is the only way you will be given attendance credit and you will be able to vote tonight. Town meeting members needing technical support during town meeting should call the technology team at the phone numbers I provided in my email sent yesterday. Town meeting members who have difficulty but are logged into Turning Point may always use the emergency vote team number, which was also shared in my email yesterday. We ask all town meeting members to vote only after the moderator has declared that polling is open. And please vote as soon as you can during the voting open period. The moderator will give a fair warning when polling is about to close in respect to the delay that could be felt by the people who are watching on television. Town meeting members will not be able to share their video. Everyone will be on mute, please, when not actively speaking to the town meeting to avoid background noise distractions. Town meeting members who want to speak should raise their hand located at the bottom Zoom toolbar to be recognized by the moderator. He will recognize people to speak in the order in which the hands are raised. When the moderator invites you to speak by name, please unmute yourself. The microphone again appears in the bottom left toolbar and identify yourself by name and precinct, just as you would if you were at the microphone in the auditorium. If you are dialed into Zoom using a telephone number exclusively, you will need to press star nine in order to raise your hand to get our attention. Town meeting members who wish to make a point of order and question the legal process should use the Q&A button also on the bottom toolbar and type the words point of order only. A staff person will inform the moderator that you have a point of order. The moderator will then call on you to speak and release your audio. If you do not have a microphone on your computer, we ask that you use the Q&A on the bottom toolbar. Type your name, your precinct, and your comment or question. A member of the town meeting team will then let you know the name of the person who will be acting as your proxy by raising their hand in your stead. Listen for the moderator to recognize that person who will then read your question or comment exactly as you have typed it. Thank you. We hope for a good night. We appreciate your patience. Thank you, Ellen. We have one 
final preliminary before we begin the motions, and that is to do a test, uh, a voting attendance test. So I'd ask Glenn to get that ready. Is that set, Glenn? Are the, are the polls open? I see a red bar, not a green bar. Are the polls open, Glenn? I see a red bar, so I don't think so. I was, I was <laughs> unmuted. <laughs> I didn't hear you say that. Polls are open. Yeah. As you can see, the polls are open. So we'll stay with it for another moment. So in about five seconds, we'll close the polls. The Belmont media polling is not yet open. There's a delay. Okay. So we'll wait a moment. Just So now we will close the polls. Let's see the tabulation. So 135, 97, 10. Great. Thank you. We'll now turn to the formalities of town meeting. We'll begin with. Um, the first motion. No, the motion. So this is a preliminary motion. I mentioned earlier that legislation um, the House and Senate passed legislation, obviously signed by the governor, that would enable us to do this uh, virtual town meeting. Uh, one of the provisions in that legislation was that town meeting members, at the beginning of the meeting, uh, vote in support uh, of the action of carrying out town meeting uh, through virtual means. So I will read this preliminary motion and then we'll go to a roll call uh, vote on this motion. Moved that the town meeting continue to meet and act on all matters on the warrant for this annual town meeting by means of the video and audio conferencing and voting technologies described in the moderator's June 1, 2020 letter to the select board posted with a warrant. So I would ask Glenn if you would open the polls and I would ask those to vote yes, no, or abstain on this preliminary motion. Glenn, I don't think.
Now the polls are open, so please cast your vote for this preliminary motion. Thank you. Polling just opened on Belmont Media, so we'll give you another five or 10 seconds. And I'm told we have an emergency vote, as Ellen explained a moment or two ago. So we will just keep the voting open for a moment while we deal with that. Thank you for your patience. Okay, the polling is closed officially. So the results are 248 in favor and two opposed. Great, thanks very much. I appreciate that huge endorsement of this effort. Mr. Moderator, we did receive a emergency vote on this question from Natalie Kostich, precinct seven, who casts a vote yes. And I ask that be added to the record. Thank you, Ms. Cushman. And that means the final official vote would be 249 in favor, two opposed, and zero abstentions. Thank you. We now move to the order of the articles. So the order of the articles, the town meeting will hear the motions in the following order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Thank you. And now we move to Article One. I'm just going. Article One is the normal um, article on the reports, but it's changed that we accept. Uh, at town meeting each year. However, you'll see it's changed slightly to reflect that we're incorporating the videos that were made by our town leaders committee chairs through Belmont Media. And we've incorporated those into the uh, record of this town meeting. So this report, this article will read as follows moved that the annual report be accepted and that the written and video reports to town meeting posted on the town's webpage be accepted and made a part of the record of this town meeting. We would then open the polls. Well, let me ask if there's any discussion 
on this article. It's routine, but I want to make sure that there aren't any questions. So if anybody has a question or issue, please raise your hand. Seeing none, we'll go to the vote under Article 1. The poll are now open. So please cast your vote for Article 1. So it's Five more seconds, please. All right, I ask the polls be closed. Glenn, please close the polls. Final tabulation is 249 in favor, none opposed, and one abstention. But I'd like uh, Ms. Cushman to. Mr. Moderator, I've received some emergency votes. Again, from Natalie Kostich, Precinct 7, voting yes. Michael McNamara, Precinct 7, voting yes. Elizabeth McIntyre, Precinct 8, I believe it's uh, Melinda, Melissa McIntyre, Precinct 8, voting yes. That's three yes to be added. The final tabulation then would be 252 yes. Zero opposed, one abstention. Yes. I'm going to ask, ask uh, Elton 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 to make an announcement. Shortly after the results of Article 1, which will appear as a roll call vote, you will be able to see whether your votes were recorded. Um, and we'll probably do another test just to let everyone settle in and make sure that their voting devices are working properly. If you have a question at that time, we do ask that you raise your hand and or if you don't see your name illuminating in blue, you can always call the tech support line and they will help you figure it out while the next presentation is happening. Mr. Moderator has agreed the further emergency voting from Ann, from Fred Paulson, Precinct 1, yes. From John Robotham, Precinct 2, yes. Suzanne Robotham, Precinct 2, yes. All on Article 1. Great, thank you. And that would bring the total to 255, yes. Zero opposed, one abstention. And are we going to scroll the votes, please?
We'll take our time as we scroll these votes so that everyone can confirm whether your vote was taken. You may see some that have still got a duplicate, but only one will be permitted to vote. So one, two names might appear, but one will be voting. Thank you. I see Mary Stearns, you have your hand up. We'll address you in a moment. Please let's wait till we get through the full roll call display. Thank you. Mary Stearns, I see that you have your name, uh, your hand up. Would you please unmute yourself and address the moderator? Yes, I have been uh, with you since uh, five of six, but my tile uh, for attendance was showing black. I've talked to Turning Point. They say my vote was recorded, but the tile still shows black. Okay. So we'll investigate that, Mary, during the reports to make sure it's properly displaying. Thank you. Adriana Poole, you have your hands up. Please unmute yourself. Adriana Poole. Uh, just a second, hi. Adriana Poole, Precinct 1. Uh, my vote was not recorded. Uh, during the time you're speaking, Ellen, um, you got muted. And so I completely missed when I was supposed to vote. And then the votes, so it sort of got interrupted a little bit and then, and then the votes appear. So I would like to record my vote as yes. Thank you. Okay. Article one, Mr. Moderator, we'll add Adriana Poole, precinct one, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Yvette Tenney, please unmute yourself. You have your hand raised. Uh, yes, Yvette Tenney, precinct one. I thought I noticed that Roger Rubel's vote, yes, counted twice. Yes, we noticed that as well but it's not actually counting. So we will be solving that problem. Thank you. Mary Kennedy, your hand is up. Okay, Tom Olson, your hand is up. Um, I have not been able, Thomasine Olson, Precinct 5, I've not been able to vote on Turning Point. I did call. Okay, so again, if you need to make an emergency vote, please call the emergency vote number. Which is? 
the number I published yesterday, I will be broadcasting that out loud over Zoom or over television. Please refer to the email that I sent yesterday. Okay. Thank you. Mary Kennedy, you have your hand up. Please unmute yourself. So let's continue. Thank you all for your patience. Um, we now turn to articles two through six, uh, which is the so-called consent agenda. Let me explain um, this briefly. Uh, this is simply an effort to streamline the votes, the discussion and voting under, uh, un under these five articles. These are by and large articles that uh, are appear every year at town meeting and generally have drawn little uh, contention or debate. So we're streamlining the consideration of the vote but I emphasize not streamlining the discussion. So when the preliminaries are over in a moment, we will open to a full discussion of any of the motions under articles two through six. But first I would ask that we take by unanimous consent uh, a vote in support of considering these together as a consent agenda. So I would ask that by unanimous consent. And then I would read the motion under these articles, which is in front of you. And we would have the debate on all five of these motions. So I would ask for unanimous consent on the decision to consider these as a com combination. If anybody objects, uh, I would ask you to raise your hand. No. Seeing Mr. Quadrider, no, I see no hands raised. Thank you. Seeing no objection then, we will, uh, consider that we the town meeting has by unanimous consent agreed to consider these five articles in combination. I'll now read the main motion under this consent agenda. Moved that the main motions under articles two through six on file with the clerk and distributed to each town meeting member prior to the town meeting be adopted. I'll also read the votes of the respective uh, committees. We're doing this again to make it easier to move through the meeting tonight rather than calling on them individually. So for the motion I just read, um, for all five articles, the select board votes unanimously in support of all five articles. The Warren Committee similarly votes unanimously in support of all five articles. And the Capital Budget Committee only weighed in on Article 4 and voted unanimously. So we now open the floor, so to speak, to discussion of any questions, comments on any of the five motions under this consent agenda. And I would ask uh, Glenn to scroll through the five. Article two is the town's legal interests, salaries, article three. Uh, article four, where's article four? We missed article four, Glenn. Right. Article four, the enterprise funds for water and sewer and stormwater. Article five, art revolving funds. Those are all traditional. And then Article 6, a transportation grant, which is straightforward. So 
please raise your hand if you would like to comment on any of these five. I recognize the moderator recognizes Chris Doyle. Thank you, uh, Chris Doyle, Precinct One. Um, just <clears throat> it's on the matter of the enterprise funds. I just I'm going to um, vote in the affirmative, but I just want to raise an issue that links the enterprise funds for water over to the budget. It's kind of a linked topic, which is that the um, reductions in the capital budget that we will discuss later on in roads um, has a, a relationship to the water pipe replacement process that's going on uh, throughout town as we know for several years and will result in um, some disjuncture in the the nice um, uh, coordinated pattern that those two um, departments have worked together over the last several years so i just want to note that and i i know um, um, Mr. Marquette has indicated he's aware and they're working on that, but I did want to note, um, especially since I live on a street that's experiencing this juncture um, in real time, that it's something that um, merits attention going forward. That's it. Great. Thank you, Ms. Doyle. Are there any other comments? No, Mr. Moderator, no other hands up. Okay. So we will proceed to a vote on this consent agenda. To be clear, the effect of this vote is to vote affirmatively or negatively on the five articles that we're considering, articles two, three, four, five, and six. So Glenn, if you would open the polls. So closed. Closed. The polls are open, so please go ahead and vote. We'll, clo we'll close the polling in five seconds. Okay, the polls are closed. Glenn, if you could show the tabulation. So the vote is 255 in favor, zero opposed and zero abstained. I believe we may have a couple of other votes. Do we miss Cushman? We do, Mr. Moderator. On the consent agenda, we have emergency votes from Mary Stearns, Precinct 3. She votes yes. From Thomasina Olson, Precinct 5. She votes yes. And 
Adriana Poole, precinct one, she votes yes. Thank you. I would make the final tabulation 258 in favor, zero opposed, zero abstentions. So that completes action on articles two through six. So we now turn to article seven and Anne Marie Mahoney will read the motion and then make a brief presentation. Anne Marie, as you well know, is chair of the Capital Budget Committee. She will actually read both motions under article seven and then we'll have a discussion of, of both uh, simultaneously. And then at the end of the discussion, We'll have a vote first on 7A and then on 7B. Thanks very much, uh, Anne-Marie, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Anne-Marie Mahoney, Town Meeting Member Precinct 1 and Chair of the Capital Budget Committee moved that $950,268 be raised and appropriated for the purchase of public safety equipment, site improvements, public works equipment, equipment for town facilities and consulting services in connection therewith to construct public ways and for building and facility and public works construction and for major maintenance and alterations, including design work as follows, said sum to be expended under the direction of the select board. B, moved that $226,147 be raised and appropriated for sidewalks as follows, said sum to be raised and expended under the direction of the select board. I think I now, here we go. Um, now I have a very brief presentation. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the capital budget in order to highlight that information that you already have accessed from both our report and my online presentation. Next slide. Um, this has been an especially difficult year for the capital budget committee as it has for everyone, but we do look forward with hope and we do cross our fingers for better times. Next slide. Our initial funding this year was what we expected in roads and sidewalks due to overrides and in water and sewer due to the enterprise funds. We expect word from the state on the chapter 90 roads money by the fall. Our discretionary funding, however, was down by $300,000 from last year. And at 1.7 million was significantly less than the 2.1 million in department requests. Next slide, please. In April, we were asked to turn over all of our roads money and a third of our discretionary funds to the operating budget. Losing 1.76 million in dedicated roads money along with the $525,000 in discretionary funds was a huge hit. But breaking our promise to protect the 2001 and 2015 override money for roads was even more difficult. Next slide, please. The departments had already cut capital items from their operating budgets like patrol cars and fire turnout gear. The department requests to the capital budget had already been limited. And now we had to make cuts that included elementary school secure vestibules, window replacements, AC compressor replacements, library equipment, vehicles, and radios. Next slide, please. So, with $950,268 available, we funded the items you will see on this slide and the next slide. No, or no, back up, back up, <laughs> go back, thank you. Note that under public safety, the ambulance and cardiac monitor set aside money continues. We also funded sidewalks, we maintain that in the budget. We have a network firewall and the lease, uh, van lease buyouts of two vehicles. Now the next slide. We put money toward the total replacement of the Winbrook PA system. 
we provided funds for some, not all of the furnishings for the police station. And our big ticket item is the DPW gasoline tank replacement, which has been on our list for at least four years. The present tank is not insurable. The new one will be above ground as new code dictates and will serve all the departments in the town, including the police, because we have had to remove the gasoline tank at the police station. Next slide, please. Our enterprise spending is similar to prior years. We did decline the purchase of one $40,000 vehicle and the proposed culvert rebuild on Trapella Road waits a joint plan between Belmont and Waltham. Next slide. I thank very much the members of the committee, John Marshall, who work closely with us, Glenn, Matt, and Pam. The Capital Budget Committee is committed to support the town through this dual budget and health crisis by contributing a huge percentage of our budget to fill the operating gap. Please remember that going forward, we have a library and multiple school buildings that require significant expensive upgrades now, not down the road. Life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. And all I ask is that you share your umbrellas. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, let me read the, um, the votes under Article 7. The Select Board, the Warrant Committee, and the Capital Budget Committee all voted unanimously for 7A and 7B. We'll now open up the floor or discussion of Article 7 for either motion 7A or 7B. So please raise your hand if you would like to speak. Moderator recognizes Ji Yun Wang. Ji Yun Wang, Precinct 8. Um, I would like to make a comment about the sidewalks. We are spending um, over $200,000 in ensuring that the sidewalks are in good condition, and I support this. But um, just as I mentioned last year that Hedges should not be what's on the sidewalks, but people. I noticed that so many cars are on the sidewalks. People are parking are on the sidewalks. And it just becomes um, so much more frustrating when we are in a time of um, social distancing, but people are homebound and needing to go out and exercise. So I see many people pushing their strollers or um, maybe elderly who are walking very cautiously or um, pushing a, a walker. Um, that they have to get off the sidewalk because there's a car parked on the sidewalk. And this is so common and so frustrating. And I feel that the sidewalk, when everything else has been so sacrificed and uh, budget cuts that we are still saving this amount for the sidewalk, that it becomes even more precious, more sacred. And um, just making sure that the sidewalk is meant for people, not cars. And so I, I want to make that comment and I, would also like to know what we can do to just make sure that cars are not parked on these sidewalks. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I would ask if one of the town officials could respond to the question that was raised. Mr. Mr. Moderator, this is Glenn Clancy. I'm happy to take a shot. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Mr. Moderator, Glenn Clancy, Director of Community Development. Um, a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago now, the Select Board changed the policy for how we spend our paper <laughs> management funds. That, that policy change allowed us to channel some of that funding into sidewalk repair and to also add curb treatments that would allow us to reestablish a vegetated shoulder, which creates a buffer between sidewalk, pedestrian walkway, and the roadway. Um, so under our program in community development, when we reconstruct roads under pavement management, we are looking for any situation where we need to reestablish shoulders. We put a, a curb treatment in to help us do that. Um, 
we lost seven roads that would have been reconstructed in 21 because of the $1.7 million budget cut. Um, as I look at my list quickly, I see that there were four of those seven roads we had targeted for sidewalk work. And on every one of those roads, if shoulders needed to be reconstructed, uh, there would have been curb treatment added to those roads as well. So unfortunately they've been cut. Uh, that work will be deferred for at least another year. Um, but policy-wise, we do have the latitude in community development to do the work that she's referring to under the pavement management program. Thank you, Mr. Clancy. Next. Uh... Um, <clears throat> Mike, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, uh, this is uh, uh, Roy Epstein, although I, I'm on the roster here as Ellen Cushman. Um, Roy Epstein, chair of the select board and town meeting member from Precinct 6. Uh, sidewalks have always been close to my heart in Belmont, and uh, this is an issue that uh, actually I have not observed myself, and I, I just was not aware of it. So I would encourage anybody who sees vehicles parked that way to call the town administrator's office and also uh, the, the non-emergency number for the police department so we can start to track uh, where it's happening and the frequency of it. That would help us respond better. Thank you, Mr. Epstein. Next speaker, um, uh, Xi has a follow-up question. Xi. Ji uh, Hong, Precinct 8. Just to clarify um, what I mean, what I mean when I say cars are on the sidewalks, it's usually people's cars who are parked on their driveways, but their cars are parked so far out that it is essentially taking up the entire sidewalk of their driveway portion and going right onto the street. So and it's in those manners, not that they are parallel parking and then going onto the sidewalk on, in, that, in that manner. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, the next, uh, Deborah, the moderator recognizes uh, Deborah Lockett. Thank you, um, Mr. Widmer. Deb Lockett, Precinct 7. I've, uh, I'd like to ask for Anne-Marie to explain um, about the reasoning behind moving the roads money, money apportioned for the roads to anything else when the voters had so <clears throat> strongly um, articulated that that only be used for the roads. And uh, maybe even talk about what happens if we just didn't spend the money versus putting it towards the um, operating budget. Ms. Mahoney. All right, hi, Anne Marie Mahoney, uh, town meeting member, precinct one, chair of the capital budget committee. I thought I could do my video, I can't. Um, the, the Capital Budget Committee was very, very torn about this request. Um, we had a lengthy discussion about it. It was not a unanimous vote to turn that money over. And the discussion revolved around the fact that we promised the town in both of those overrides, 01 and 15, that that money would go to the roads. And since 01, I think we have done, a, as a town, a very good job of finally having a predictable roads program, having enough stream of money dedicated to the, those roads every season, building season, so that we've made a lot of progress. So it really sort of breaks our hearts to now stop that progress, in essence, to break that uh, promise to the voter. But when confronted with everything else going on in the town, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world, we ultimately, Capital Budget Committee, wanted to be team players and say, all right, this is extremely painful, but it's a one-off. We'll let this happen. We want to contribute. We don't want to see personnel layoffs. We do not want to see uh, needed programs cut. So we will let this road money be taken. But it was not an easy decision for us. And I can say, I think, with some certitude that it's not a decision that we would do again. It's not something that people now can keep coming back to us and take the road to money. That is not happening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney. Further discussion under Article 7.
follow up from Ms. Lockett? Yes, thank you, Mike Widmer. Uh, my follow up question is, is there something that we can say uh, in writing that says this is a one time not to be, um, you know, used again, totally recognize that we are in um, beyond a rainy day situation where we save our money for if we have an issue. Um, and I recognize that every department has been cutting and sacrificing a lot. I totally understand that. Um, I do really think we need to honor the voters and all of the people at the very least in my precinct, but all the other precincts that were really adamant about if we vote on roads, it goes nowhere to roads. So I would like somewhere in some language to show up to say that this is a one-time event. Yes, COVID has hit everybody, but we cannot look at this uh, pot of money in this way again. I, Ann Marie Mahoney, town meeting member, precinct one. Um, I think all members of the capital budget committee would agree with you. And one of our concerns in letting this money go was the precedent that it would set, that it's okay to raid money that has been designated for a specific purpose by an override because then you lose that trust with the voter and we don't wanna do that. Um, so that is a concern for us. Also, I think in the, the big scheme of things, you know, the capital budget is 3% of the town's overall budget roughly. And we have contributed 46% of the $5 million that is going to the operating potential deficit. So I get it, it's, it's sort of the easy place to go. I know it wasn't easy for anyone to do it, but this can't happen going forward. It just can't. Um, facilities is way underfunded. We're looking at the Cherry Mill School. It will be 20, it is 23 years old. We need to replace that roof. The compressors have failed. I can go on and on about each of the buildings in the town. There are significant structural and systems uh, concerns and issues that need to be addressed and they're addressed by the capital budget. We are chronically underfunded, but to go back to the roads. Yes, I mean, I think the minutes from this meeting can be the statement that say, we're doing it this year. This is an unprecedented emergency. We want to help the town, but we do not want to do this again. The moderator recognizes Travis Frank. Hi, thank you. Travis Frank from Precinct 5. Um, I would just like to take a moment to think, reflect, possibly uh, maybe a comment from the Warrant Committee or who, who would be best to advise. Um, what can we learn from this? It seems like we had to raid the capital budget, in particular the roads, of course, that, were, that uh, we just discussed, um, budget. And I'm wondering if we could have done something prior uh, in the previous years or done reflected to not be so tight or so thin with our budgets and that possibly have stormed this or, or weathered the storm better. So if anyone had any comments about, in hindsight, what would we have done? I think that might be a good moment to think about uh, as we go forward. Thank you. Ms. Lapp, did you, or Ms. Garvin? Yeah, I, 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 I can try to address some of that. Um, Patrice Garvin, town administrator. So FY21 budget was extremely challenging. Um, we pretty much started the budget back in September, um, October of last year. The budget was done three different times. Um, we realized going um, into the 21 budget that it was going to be a tough budget. Um, what happened with COVID only exacerbated that, um, like many towns. Unfortunately, the town was already in a, a very tenable state when we started preparing for the 21 budget and future budgets. Um, I would say that the, the reason, um, when, well, let me go back. We had a balanced budget back in February of this year. We had a balanced budget. We had a joint meeting with the Warren Committee, the School Committee, the Select Board and the Capital Budget Committee. I presented and, and along with John Phelan, the superintendent, we presented a balanced budget uh, to the town. Uh, but a month later, COVID hit and in early, in early March, we realized that we were going to have some revenue impacts due to COVID-19 with state aid, with um, local receipts, new growth. We realized the economy was pretty much coming to a halt. 
and we really needed to just look at the revenues and the projections and to um, we um, we do the entire budget in pretty much a six week period. So what why we looked to the roads um, budget was it is a $1.7 million expenditure within the operating budget. Nowhere else in the budget um, where, where we could find that big of an amount that wouldn't would minimize the impact to the general operating budget um, through potential layoffs or anything like that. So unfortunately, we were already lean going into um, town meeting and then COVID hit and then there was an additional $5 million in revenue that we were would not be so I think it was just a, a bunch of different storms um, that kind of converged all at the same time. I don't know how you prepare and 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 and, and look um, and prepare to COVID. It was not anything we had ever um, thought could happen. It's something I've never seen in my career. So it really took the effort of all the parties involved, capital budget, school committees, board, weren't able to put forward a balanced budget that is going to be presented before you this evening. Mr. Moderator, could I just add a couple of comments to that? Mr. Epstein. Thank you. Uh, Roy Epstein, Chair of the Select Board. Uh, everything that Patrice said is exactly right. I, I would add to it that so the COVID-19 experience was an unforeseeable shock. And in a different era, the uh, a free cash fund is something that was supposed to serve as an insurance policy to allow us to handle unexpected expenses or unexpected revenue shortfalls. The problem we've been in for the last few years is that free cash has been one of the things we've been using to um, um, in preparation of the budget, instead of really reserving it in principle as we should have been. And by the time COVID hit in March, free cash was no longer at a level that would, that would allow us to use it as a complete insurance policy. And at that point, we had to face the very difficult choice of what's, what's uh, plan B? because free cash was, was not available. And unfortunately, uh, as Patrice explained, um, uh, roads became a victim of that. Uh, the road budget became a victim of that, but I completely sympathize with the previous uh, questioner that as far as I'm concerned, this is a one-time event that will not repeat itself. It's, it's an artifact of the extraordinary stresses that COVID-19 has put upon the budget. Uh, Mr. Frank has a follow-up followed by Kate Bowen and Sue Bass. All right, thank you. And I, I would like to say, uh, Travis Frank, uh, Precinct 5. Um, I do understand the heroic nature of the last few months of budgeting. I appreciate the town. Um, I think the budget that was pulled together was good. I would just say one thing that of note is when we passed the override in 2015, uh, of course, we did earmark the road money, for instance, um, along with the other priorities. But it also said that we were pretty open to the public that uh, it was a three year override and to feel that we stretched it um, and where I would say people were proud to stretch it to six years seems like it could have put us in the situation uh, without the free cash Roy that you just mentioned. So um, it seems like uh, anyway, we stretched ourselves pretty thin, uh, which was good, but that possibly could have led uh, to the situation we're in now. Thank you. Roy Epstein, Chair of the Select Board, you're right. There, there is that connection. Thank you. I'd recognize now uh, Kate Bowen. Oh. Thank you, um, Kate Bowen, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 4, speaking as a Town Meeting Member. Um, my question, you know, I, I appreciate the conversation around the, the previous override funds dedicated to the road um, from several years ago and more recently from 2015. Um, I, I also realized that there are other funds available to the town um, for specifically for roads programming. And I wondered if uh, the director of community development could speak to some of the other funding sources that are available to him to continue to make improvements for the town's uh, road and sidewalk infrastructure. And as well, uh, what 
kinds of innovations that we might see, you know, recognizing that even with MassDOT, um, the lane width recommendations, for example, have been reduced over time as, um, as shared streets have become more common in the urban environment. Thank you. Mr. Clancy, did you want to make a brief uh, reply? And then I want to recognize Laurie Slapp on the previous commentary. Sure. Uh, Mr. Moderator, Glenn Clancy, Director of Community Development. Um, the only obvious uh, alternative source of funding that I can think of at the moment is Complete Streets. Uh, we are completing an application to submit for the July 1st deadline to chase some funding from that program. Um, I know that recently there was some money made available for some shade streets, uh, shared streets. We're not chasing that money. Um, we don't think that it's a program that's worth the uh, time that we'd have to put into it. We uh, have staff cuts. We uh, straight out bandwidth is very limited for us at this time. Um, just don't have the ability to do everything that, that uh, people seem to want us to do. I've got two positions in my department that weren't backfilled. We have overtime that's been cut. Uh, on the town side of the budget, um, we just don't have the capacity at this time to chase some of these programs that people are interested in. Um, we've been lucky to pick up a couple of earmarks through Representative Rogers and Senator Brownsberger. Um, some of that money will go to the intersection of Lexington and Sycamore Street. We're opening that bid actually at the end of the month. So we'll be signalizing that intersection soon. Um, we're making progress where we can, when we can. Um, staffing limitations is definitely a challenge for us. Thank you. Ms. Bowen, did you have a follow-up or not? I guess not. Um, Ms. Slapp, Laurie Slapp, Chair of the Warrant Committee, would like to comment, I think, on the previous discussion. Ms. Slapp. I, I did, but most of my points have been made. This is Laurie Slapp, um, so I will not repeat them. I will just say that I think we have learned a lot from the pandemic, and certainly something, as was said, of this scale, and also that came so suddenly is something that really created the perfect storm this year. And I think the decision was made to try to preserve the, uh, the workforce, preserve the FTEs as, as best we could um, in this crisis. That's Thank it. you, Ms. Slapp. I'll now recognize um, Mark Palillo. Mr. Palillo, you're there, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, there I am. I didn't get that immediately, so there I have it now, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Mark Palillo, town meeting member, precinct eight, and also a member of the financial task force. First and foremost, Mr. Moderator, I wanna uh, thank you and congratulate you and Ellen Cushman and the rest of the town clerk team for organizing what I think is, is actually going incredibly well, town meeting and also the town administration. I just wanted to briefly comment on uh, uh, Travis Frank's sort of point about should we have thought about this and planned for this? And, and I think it's a point well taken. Um, as a member of the financial task force, the the, what we're realizing now clearly beyond the need for a pretty significant override is that we were facing a difficult 20, fiscal 21 anyway, and a fiscal 22 outside of the pandemic. And so upon reflection, and even as I served on the select board, you know, what I've realized is that when we got the override passed in 2015, we all sort of breathed a sigh of relief and said, let's stretch it three years to four years. But upon reflection, we probably needed to start to plan for the future, which we didn't, and I'll include myself in this, uh, effectively do. And so I think the lesson learned is if we are successful in the fall or the spring, and we need to be, um, that we need to really put together a long-term financial plan so that outside of a pandemic, that we don't reach this, we were hitting a cliff anyway in 22. If you listen to um, Financial Task Force Chair Tom Caputo's presentation, or um, he's, he said that a lot of the deficit had to do with any way we're gonna hit it without the pandemic. So as a community, uh, the Warrant Committee, Capital Budget Committee, the Select Board, the School Committee, administrations need to really think about a long-term financial plan so that we don't reach this cliff again. That's the lesson learned from a successful override that we stretched for six years. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Polillo. 
Seeing no additional hands, we'll go to- Mr. Moderator, uh, can I just make one more comment addressing a, a couple of the comments that have been made? And that is that the Capital Budget Committee always has a five-year plan. We did not publish that this time this year because it needs to be really looked at long and hard. And our intention is that by the fall town meeting, we would publish our full capital budget report with the five-year projections. So we always know going forward what the various departments are looking at for purchases, for equipment, for programs that they and repairs and equipment that they need to be doing. That does allow us to juggle a little bit as we go forward. That being said, this year is so extraordinary that it is the intention of the Capital Budget Committee to sit down early in the fall and really spend a lot of time on that five-year plan because it's going to need some adjustment. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney. For the record, um, I was Anne Marie Mahoney, Chair of the Capital Budget Committee. Uh, we'll now go to a vote under Article 7. We will first vote on 7A and then we will vote subsequently on 7B. So I would ask Matt for the polls to be open for 7A. The polls are open, so please go ahead and cast your vote. Yes or no for 7A. Mr. Moderator, Ellen O'Brien Cushman, Town Clerk. I remind people who are calling the emergency phone number to cast a vote, please do not leave a voicemail message. Call again and someone will answer. Thank you. It's gone. It's gone. Five more seconds for the voting. So let's close the polls, show the tabulation. So the final vote is 245 in favor, eight opposed, two abstain for the motion under uh, Article 7A. And we'll need to make a, yes, uh, thank you, ma'am. I'm going to run through the vote tally here. So, Ms. Cushman, are there supplemental votes? Yes, Mr. Moderator. There are a few emergency votes. Sue Bass, Precinct 3, voted yes. Adriana Poole, Precinct 1, voted yes. Thomasina Olson, Precinct 5, voted yes. Anne-Marie Mahoney, Precinct 1, voted yes. 
Joel Samuels, precinct six voted yes. So that's five additional. That's five additional yeses. Yes. So that would bring the total to 250, 250 yes, yes, eight opposed, eight opposed. and two abstained. Eight. Thank you. So now let's go directly to the vote under Article 7B. The polls are open. Give it another five seconds here. All right, Glenn, let's close the polls. Glenn. The final, final tabulation on Article 7B, 247 yes, six opposed, three abstain. And Ms. Cushman? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Alan O'Brien Cushman, Town Clerk. On Precinct 7, Motion B, Joel Samuels, Precinct 6, voted yes as an emergency vote. Thomasina Olson, Precinct 5, voted yes, emergency vote. So that would bring the, let me look back at the table. Okay. Yes, Glenn. All right, thank you, Glenn. Can we look back at the total one last time? Just so I can um, give the final official vote. 249 yes, six opposed, three abstain. Um, Julie, our court reporter, probably others as well, but she certainly who does remarkable work, needs a very brief recess. So um, let us please take about three minutes. Thank you.
So we're now back live for continuation of the meeting. We'll turn to Article 8, uh, the OPED Stabilization Fund. Let me say um, at the outset that the votes under this article, both the Warrant Committee and the Select Board, support this article unanimously. I'll ask Laurie Slapp, who's chair of the Warrant Committee, to read the motion. Ms. Slapp. Uh, Laurie Slapp, Chair of the Warren Committee, Town Meeting Member Precinct 6. That the town appropriate and transfer $50,000 from the general fund free cash and to appropriate and transfer a total of $27,960 from the Water Enterprise Fund, the Sewer Enterprise Fund, and the Light Enterprise Fund to the other post employee benefits OPEB stabilization fund for the purpose of funding other post employment benefits as follows. Town $50,000, Light $16,858, Sewer $4,112, Water $6,990 for a total of $77,960. And I just had a couple, a couple of comments to make, Mr. Moderator, um, about yes. this article. I looked it up and in the OPEB uh, trust fund, there is just over $5 million as of the end of April. The total in the fund was $5,115,869. And I would just like to also point out, this was another area that was cut dramatically. I'm trying to balance the budget after the COVID outbreak. Last year, the town uh, put 552,000 or 552,695 to be exact um, into this uh, fund and this year it's down to fifty thousand dollars, as you can see. Thank you, Ms. Slap. Is there any discussion questions on Article Eight? One moment. Uh, David Palestock, Mr. Palestock, moder moderator recognizes you. David, can you unmute your? Sorry. I'm sorry, David Palstock, Precinct 4, the unmute thing just, just came up this second. <laughs> um, uh, my question just has to do with the historical context of this particular amount and whether this is a historically low amount, perhaps, given our budget constraints this year. Ms. Slapp? Uh, yes, I think that is in fact true. This was look looking to lower it to the minimum. I think the guidelines we would certainly as is the case with the roads we just discussed, would ideally like it to be higher, um, but we did try to um, keep it at a minimum so we could divert the remainder to the operating budget. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Cohane, the moderator recognizes you. Hi, it's Kathy Cohane, Precinct 2. So my question is, I thought I had heard that this factor or the funding of the stabilization fund is considered as part of our rating and borrowing um, factors. If anyone could speak to um, how this is viewed in terms of the level of funding and how it factors into borrowing would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cohane. Uh, Mr. Carmen, are you available to respond. Mr. Moderator, Floyd Cameron. Uh, this uh, other post-employment benefit is one of the many components in our uh, 
rating discussions with both Moody's and S&P. Uh, this was also mentioned at our last couple of rating calls that there would be a modest decrease in our OPEP contribution. One of the benefits we have is we are one of the few communities in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that has an OPEP trust, an irrevocable trust. There's 351 communities in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I think there's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about 30 to 35 uh, communities that have a trust. Uh, Belmont is, from a town perspective, is out front on funding their OPEB liability. Uh, it's a shame this year because of COVID-19 and reducing the budget. And hopefully next year, we will get back to uh, a little higher contribution to OPEB. Uh, question was asked before, was, was this the uh, low point over the last 10 years? Yes, it was the low point. Uh, we've been averaging somewhere around 300,000 per year. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carmen. Uh, Mr. Kalonsky, Steve, Steve Kalonsky, moderator recognizes you. Oh uh, yeah, Steve Kalonsky, Precinct 6. I'm just wondering what the unfunded OPEB liability is estimated at at present. Maybe somebody could provide that. Mr. Carmen. Uh, Floyd Carmen, town treasurer. It's in a neighborhood of about $96 million. Thank you. Uh, Chris Doyle, moderator recognizes you. Thanks. Um, the prior question, Chris Doyle, Precinct 1. Um, the prior question um, kind of links with what I was going to mention is for People who are interested in the gory details, there just was released about a month ago or so, the updated um, actuarial report on OPEB, which reflects the amount that Floyd just mentioned, the 96 million, which is up slightly from the last actuarial report, not up very much, but that has all the details of kind of the components, if anyone's interested in reading that, and that is, I think, posted on the town website. Thank you, Ms. Doyle. Mr. Carmen, any further discussion? All right, seeing no hands, we'll go to a vote on the motion under Article 8. So the polling is open. Another five seconds on the voting. All right, let's close the polls and display the result. So the final result is 252 in favor, zero opposed, three abstain. Ms. Cushman, are we down to? Yes, Mr. Moderator, Ellen O'Brien Cushman, Town Clerk. Things are going in our favor and people are joining in. We now have Joel Samuelson. Yes, as an emergency vote. That would make the. 
I would make the yes total 253. This is Ellen O'Brien Cushman again. While the moderator, we're waiting for the votes um, roster to show up. I do remind anybody who has logged into Turning Point or attempted to log into Turning Point with two separate devices to please log out of that one device because it's just making your name show up as a duplicate even though you're not voting on more than one device. Thank you. All right, with final tabulation, 253, yes, zero, uh, no, and three abstentions. Now we'll go to Article 9, the operating budget, which is the main item of business tonight. Let me briefly explain how we're going to manage this. Um, first, we will have Laurie Slap, chair of the Warrant Committee, will read the motion, and she'll make a brief presentation. Roy Epstein, chair of the select board, will follow with a few comments. Uh, we'll then open discussion on all items in the budget except for the schools. Uh, so that would cover any department in the budget except for the schools. Once we've had the discussion completed on all of those uh, areas, we'll turn to the schools. We won't have a vote. We're going to have just one vote at the end. That's in order to streamline, but the discussion is open, so we're not streamlining the discussion. So we'll turn to the schools. Kate Bowen, the secretary of the school committee, will make a brief statement, followed by John Phelan, the superintendent. And then we have our only amendment of the evening from Julie Crockett. She will present her amendment, and then there will be discussion of her amendment. Once that discussion is complete, we'll have a vote on Ms. Crockett's amendment. Once that's determined, we then go back and have a discussion of the schools. And when that's complete, we will have a final vote on the entire operating budget under Article 9. And I'll explain this as we go along. But um, we've done this in a way to try to um, focus the discussion and have fewer uh, votes because in past years, as you remember, we vote each department separately. Uh, and then in the end, we'll just simply have a final vote on the budget. As amended by Ms. Crockett's uh, motion uh, amendment or as unamended. So we'll begin with uh, Ms. Slapp, Chair of the Warren Committee. Ms. Slapp. Ari Slap, Warren Committee Chair, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 6. Moved that the following amounts be appropriated for the fiscal year 2021 operating budget and be raised in the tax levy or from general revenues of the town. General government, $4,704,540. Employee benefits, retirement expenses, $8,728,97. Employee benefits, other reserves, including health insurance, insurance, and salary reserve, $6,141,652. Public safety, $13,230,549. Belmont Public Schools, $61,485,641. Regional schools, $1,721,238. Public services, 
Human Services, $3,213,983. Principal Debt and Interest, $15,560,211. And that the town transfer the following sums to meet in part appropriations made at this town meeting. From fund balance and abatement and exemption surplus account, $235,000. From Belmont Municipal Light Department, $1,650,000. From unreserved fund balance free cash, $3,792,665. From parking meters receipts, $90,000. From water revenue for indirect costs, $664,000. From sewer revenue for indirect cost, $519,000. From capital endowment fund for various capital expenditures, $125,000. From capital projects fund for various capital expenditures, $25,000. From cemetery perpetual care fund interest transfer out account, $25,000. Thank you, Ms. Lapp. You have a brief presentation. I do. Uh, it's difficult to summarize a $132 million budget in just a few minutes. I will do my best just to give you a very broad overview. If you turn to the next slide, you'll see a table that shows um, a, a very basic breakdown of the funds spent. Um, as you'll see, the town operating budget is down by 2% in FY21. Um, the school operating budget here from the general fund will raise uh, by 1.4%. We are pulling money from the uh, circuit breaker reserve funds to, get to uh, fund some special education costs in FY21. So as you'll see in the footnote here, if one considers the general fund plus the grants and revolving accounts, the school operating budget increases 3.3%. Um, we've already discussed how the capital budget is dropping precipitously by 47%. And the fixed cost you'll see is up almost 20%. And this is really due to the second round of borrowing for the middle and high school um, and the increase of about $5 million in debt service. So next slide is just uh, uh, several bullets that uh, outline the budget highlights this year. Um, as we've talked about before, as Patrice Garvin explained, um, already before COVID hit, it was still the plan to use one-time funds to stretch the override one additional year. Um, when COVID hit, um, it's anticipated that that would be up bringing $5 million anticipated revenue. And so there was a lot of work done very quickly this spring to find the associated cuts to the budget. Um, as I said, the second round of financing for the middle and high school raises fixed costs just over $5 million. And if we took this increase out of the previous table, the FY21 budget is actually lower than last year's um, by just almost 1%. And I would just like to Finally, here on this, um, in this part, say that the Warren Committee does believe that the override is needed um, to avoid significant cuts in service in FY22 and future years. We know we've talked about the uh, deferred capital needs, the one-time funds have been exhausted this year, and we have a fundamental structural deficit that needs to be addressed. Um, and the next slide, the Warren Committee would just like to bring to your attention some risks to the FY21 budget. COVID-19 is of course the big question. It's still unclear what the overall economic impact will be, exactly how it will impact town services, especially the school department. We don't know if there will be a second wave that might bring a, a employee illness and, and increased overtime costs. And also there's just some uncertainty about what will, will be the degree of federal and state reimbursement and what the timing might be. Um, I'd also like to bring the attention of town meeting to compensation costs. We've talked about this for as long as I can remember that compensation costs account for about 67% of the budget. Um, this, all the union contracts are under negotiation. The current contracts um, expire at the end of this month. Um, and so this will be very important in FY21 and beyond as to how these are settled. And lastly, um, free cash about this this evening. Um, and this received some attention in the Warren Committee report before uh, Ms. Crocker brought her amendment. But as we've said, it's below the recommended guidelines, and especially in this time of great uncertainty, um, it's needed for flexibility to fund unanticipated needs. And it, right now, um, the uh, calculations we had showed that it would be about $2.4 million before it was replenished at the end of this year. 
But again, even that is uncertain as we try to understand exactly the impacts of COVID-19. Um, so that is my brief overview. I guess it's down to Mr. Epstein. Yes, thank you, Ms. Lapp. Uh, Roy Epstein, the chair of the select board. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Lori. Um, uh, let me just briefly summarize a little bit of the process and, and the thought process uh, behind the budget that you're seeing tonight. Uh, as Patrice Garvin said before, we, we thought we had a budget in February, and then the situation changed dramatically in March. And in, in our estimation, uh, the budget that we had in February suddenly had a hole of about $5 million. And the town is obligated to run a balanced budget. We can't run a budget deficit. So we had to identify $5 million. Uh, and that uh, gap obviously was driven by a fall in revenue because we expect a significant drop in state aid. We expect a significant drop in local taxes such as motor vehicle excise taxes and restaurant taxes. So that large drop in revenue uh, had to be offset by corresponding reductions in expenditure. That, that was a huge challenge. And for several weeks, it was the focus of an enormous effort by the select board, the school committee, the warrant committee, town administrator, school superintendent, uh, meeting repeatedly, recognizing that there are demands across the board. Every department on the town side, the schools all had demands uh, and there was not going to be enough money to meet all of those demands relative to what we thought we had in February. Uh, so the budget that you see before you tonight reflects uh, a consensus on what, uh, what our priorities ought to be after all the input from the school side and the town side and a lot of back and forth. Uh, I don't, uh, we don't think it's advisable to cut this budget any further, but we also don't think it's advisable to increase it any further because uh, there are still risks as Lori just alluded to uh, in fiscal 21, the, the revenue situation is still not certain. There could be a revenue shortfall relative to what we're budgeting to. There may be unexpected expenses from COVID and other sources uh, that are not reflected in this budget. And we also have a concern if any additional expenses starting in fiscal 21 are in the, are in the nature of multi-year recurring obligations, that creates a whole additional set of issues. Uh, and free cash is simply not uh, at a sufficient level to accommodate all of these. Um, uh, let me put it differently. Free cash is all we've got at this point to insure us against shortfalls of this nature. So um, that, that is the uh, the, the problems that we've been wrestling with since March, and I'm, I will close just because Anne Marie Mahoney is always reminded of a song. I, I'm reminded of a song. If you like Jackson Brown, uh, one of his great songs was Running on Empty. And the town really is close to running on empty, which is why there's so much focus on what we can do for an override uh, in order to pave the way for fiscal 22. Um, but what we have in front of us for fiscal 21, I think is a good budget and I highly recommend it uh, for favorable action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Epstein. Um, reporting the votes, the select board, the warrant committee, the school committee, and the capital budget committee all voted unanimously in support of article nine. So now I'm opening up the floor, so to speak, to discussion any aspect of the motion before you, except for the schools. And we'll, once this is complete, we'll turn to the schools. Emily Peterson, the moderator recognizes you. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, I just had a question about the regional- Please, please identify- Oh, yourself. I'm sorry. 
Emily Peterson, town meeting member, precinct one. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know about the over a million dollars allocated for the regional, voc I believe, vocational school. I thought that we had opted out of the Minuteman, um, let's see, uh, or the regional schools. Yeah, 1.7 million there. Uh, could you just clarify a little bit on that expenditure? So who would like to respond to that question? I can start. This is Laurie Slap, Chair of the Warren Committee, um, Town Meeting Member Precinct 6, then I'll ask others to uh, add other remarks. Um, yes, you're right. This is a broader category than Minuteman. If I remember correctly, there are approximately 41 students attending Minuteman. Um, there are a, several that got in as in the freshman class, but we do have upperclassmen there. And then this would also include students who are going to other programs, um, whether that be in, in was one of them. Um, so it's a, it's a broader category because you're right, are, it, Belmont is no longer a member of the Minuteman District. Mike, I, I, I'd like to expand on what some of the things Laurie said. Sure, Ms. Garvin, Town yeah. Administrator. Thank you. Chief Garvin, Town Administrator. The of that 1.7 million will be allocated to the Minuteman Regional School District for those 41 kids, 41 students that uh, Lori had mentioned. Um, the remaining is an estimate um, of 25 students that will be going to other regional schools uh, in the area, such as um, Medford Regional School. Um, this is due to um, there not being any other spaces available at Minuteman Regional Vocational School. Thank you. And I think there was a follow-up from Ms. Peterson. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, just to follow up, uh, you know, considering the amendment that's proposed and how many students will this $1.7 million benefit versus the $400,000 that's uh, as part of the amendment out of free cash? Is there any re wiggle room in this number? That's, that's another question there. Thank you. Hi, again, this is Patrice Garvin, Town Administrator. Uh, the 25 students is an estimate. Um, there could be some savings, some savings in that line. Unfortunately, I do not know what those savings could be. There are a lot of questions in regards to the school year up ahead. Um, these funds, the regional school funds, are not within the school budget. That it is a separate line under the, the town operating budget. So the amendment uh, strictly goes to um, additional funds within the pub Belmont Public Schools operating budget. Thank you. Uh Next call on Ji Yun Wang, followed by Jill Clark and Deb Lockett. Ji. Ji Yun Wang, Precinct 8. Um, I have a question for um, Wes Chen, Mr. Chen. Um, first, mm -hmm. I want to say thank you for uh, all the hard work that you and your department has been doing um, in helping the uh, town of Belmont um, deal with COVID. Um, as there is so much uncertainty uncertainty coming still, I believe. Um, I just wanted to get a sense from you as to how you feel um, your department may be adequately supported or do you feel that, um, well, it seems that every good department is at, at, is at its strains, but um, I did wanna get um, a comment from you because it seems that um, if anything, your department will be the most impacted in the next few months and has been impacted greatly in the last few months. Mr. Chen, did you want to reply? Hi, yes, um, Wesley Chen, uh, Director of Health. Um, thank you for that question, G. Um, so to be honest with you, we're gonna struggle. Um, we have a small department and we have a number of state mandates we're supposed to be responsible for on a regular basis. Uh, COVID is, is putting a strain on our ability to respond to a number of things such as routine uh, food inspections, uh, following up in person on housing complaints, uh, and your typical nuisance complaints related to rats, trash, overgrown lawns, odors, uh, sounds. Um, so it's going to be a challenge if, if COVID continues. Do you suppose um, that there could be any additional funding um, coming from the state 
as more demands are put upon um, local towns. Mr. Chin. Sure, uh, Wesley Chin, health director. Um, so we, we have received some money from the state. Uh, we've received a total of $22,000 from the Department of Public Health, which we have until the end of August to spend down. And then we are eligible for uh, COVID related expenses to be reimbursed by the CARES Act at the federal level. That's good until the end of the calendar year. Thank you. The next uh, person I would recognize is Jill Clark. Thank you, Jill Clark, uh, Tommy, the member precinct seven. Um, I had a, a very similar question. I was wondering um, if Mr. Chen would mind speaking specifically to the ability to the health department to conduct contact tracing with the existing budget and whether additional funds might be needed in the future. Mr. Chin. Sure, thanks. Uh, Wesley Chin, the part of director of health. Um, so right now we are tapping into the funds provided by the state um, to conduct contact tracing. We are um, utilizing um, a, a retired physician who is helping us. And we also plan to use funding to um, have school nurses help us throughout the summer. Uh, but once we get beyond the summer, I'm not really sure what we're gonna do. Next uh, moderator recognizes Deb Lockett. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Deb Lockett, Precinct 7. I'm wondering about public safety dollars for 13 plus million dollars and wondering what the town is talking about now for changing uh, or redirecting some of that funding toward building community interaction, anti-racism efforts, and certainly hiring social workers and mental health professionals to step in instead of police officers. Mike, I, I can start the beginning. So, Ms. Garvin. Uh, Patrice Garvin, town administrator. Uh, before I hand off the social worker uh, responding to uh, calls that come in um, to Jamie, I do wanna say that the, the police department and the public safety budgets on the town side have been reduced um, in the FY21 budget. Um, both the police department, the fire department and DPW's overtime has been um, significantly reduced in FY21 to address uh, the COVID impact that we experienced in March and April. Um, those are gonna have direct impact on the services that are provided within the town of Belmont. Um, the fire department, um, as Amory Mahoney mentioned in her capital update, um, lost the turnout gear that has been funded traditionally in their operating budget year over year. The police department lost uh, police cruisers in the FY21 budget and the DPW also lost um, equipment um, to maintain fields and things like that without town, in, throughout town. So the public safety departments are, have already been reduced in FY21. Um, so before we reduce further, um, there needs to be a considerable amount of discussion, um, input from the community, input from the state. Um, I would hesitate to do any major overhaul of any department in town without a clear direct plan of how we move forward um, to do that. Um, Jamie, I don't know if you wanted to respond um, to the comment about social workers responding to calls that are received um, through the department. Sure. Mr. McIsaac. Hi, uh, Jamie McIsaac, your police chief. Um, so regarding the, the social workers, when I interviewed for the police chief's job in, in, the, uh, in, in the fall of 2019, I think the uh, committee asked me what I would do if I had an unlimited budget. And I think my response was I would hire two paralegals and two social workers. Um, you know, there's a, I, I understand where, where this question is coming from and all that. I, I just don't know um, how uh, replacing police officers with a social worker would work. Right now, I don't think um, that we have enough work, that we have 40 hours of work for a social worker. We do use... Um, Janet Amder uh, with the health department, the youth and family coordinator outreach. We use Springwell uh, for work with our elderly and we use the advocates in Waltham um, for people that are, are in crisis. I would, I would um, I'm not against having a social worker it would be good. Um, I think that so, I think 
down the road, we may see uh, regional options where we share one with Waltham or Arlington or, or Watertown. Um, but um, as far as uh, that goes, you know, w one thing that uh, the, you know, the police, obviously we do a lot of different functions in our job. One of them is sort of social work. We have a community services division. And one of the reasons that we do these things, we cross train with police is because police can always be police officers. A social worker can't be a police officer. A social worker can't go out and respond to a, a crash or uh, respond to other routine police calls. Thank you, Mr. McIsaac. Are there any further, uh, Joe Bernard? Um, Moderator recognizes you. Hi, uh, Joe Bernard, town meeting member, precinct three. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. So uh, I actually have a remark <clears throat> related to that, the previous question. Um, aside from the public safety budget in total, I had actually reached out to Chief McIsaac earlier this week um, to ask specifically about costs incurred uh, in response to protests and public demonstrations. Um, I think we can reasonably expect these to continue throughout the summer and through the fall. So that that's in into our FY 21. Um, so he he was kind enough to provide a very thorough response. I don't think I have enough time to read the whole email verbatim, so I won't do that. But I will just paraphrase it uh, to share with everyone what I learned. Um, I guess the relevant context is that Belmont's patrol division includes Belmont police officers and uh, NEMLEC officers. That's N-E-M-L-E-C. It's the acronym for Northeastern Massachusetts Law Enforcement Council. Uh, it's a group of about 65 Massachusetts cities and towns that pool their resources together to fund units that provide their services in whichever member community they're needed. Um, and these units include a school threat assessment and response team, uh, a SWAT rapid re and re rapid response team, um, and others. And so, so one of the things within the scope of their services is large event security and crowd control. Um, so, so, so the question to that I posed to Chief McIsaac was really two questions. It was number one: Belmont police officers um, have they been requested at any recent public demonstrations outside of Belmont? And he told me no. So I'm taking that as um, to reasonably mean there's no risk in FY21 uh, for that team for that reason. Um, and about NEMLEC, uh, Chief McIsaac told me that FY21 is budgeted the same as FY20. Um, and I guess here's where I will directly quote him. He said, quote, ultimately the BPD can limit the number of call outs an officer responds to. We also have the ability to tell the officers that if they need to go on a call out, they'll be compensated with personal time rather than overtime. Naturally, the last two months between rolling rallies and protests have kept NEMLEC quite active, but I do not have any concerns regarding our budget, end quote. Um, so I thought that was relevant and, and helpful information. So I just wanted to share that with everyone. And if I may, on a separate topic, Mr. Martyr, I do have a question. Yes, please. Um, there's, there's a line item in the operating expense budget called warrant committee reserve for $400,000. I'm curious, I haven't seen much about that. How, how was that amount calculated? And is that something that was ever considered to be reduced or cut when we were trying to balance the budget? Ms. Slapp? Laurie Slapp, Chair of the Warrant Committee. Um, this is $400,000 that's put in the budget every year for any unanticipated, we have criteria that we have to look at. Um, if, and it's something for us that's unanticipated, extraordinary, is presented in a timely manner, can be distinctly quantifiable. So in prior years, it's used for things that the snow and ice budget, for example, goes over if there's overtime that is um, completely unanticipated. This year we have used um, about $335,000, I believe, for expenses that were an overrun for the police department project that were completely unanticipated. We actually had a vote at the Warren Committee last night to approve $250,000. So this is, um, as Roy Epstein was talking about, going to free cash as at the last resort. Um, this res Warren Committee Reserve Fund is really the place before that, um, where this, 
the request is put forth to the Warren Committee to decide how to expend these funds. Thank you, Ms. Slapp. Uh, Michael McNamara, you're next, and Dan Barry. Uh, Michael McNamara, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 7. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit more about free cash. I know that was sort of being a, um, a major focus. And I know since we're talking about um, balancing our budget, I was wondering how much free cash is currently available for us. Um, I was wondering also, how is it replenished? I just wanted to have that um, brought up again, just to make sure everyone has a, a where knows what we're talking about. We're talking about free cash um, and how it will affect and possibly help with overruns and costs um, due to COVID. Ms. Garvin, did you want to, or Ms. Slack? Patrice Garvin, um, town administrator. So currently the, the balance after tonight, if, if all the uh, motions pass, the balance will be $2.4 million going into FY22. Um, we are using in this town meeting $3.7 million of our free cash towards the operating budget. Um, that is um, part of the $8.1 million in free cash that was certified last fall um, by the Division of um, uh, Department of Revenue. Um, we will be certifying our free cash again for FY20, and that certification will come in um, in the fall of this year. Um, I can't speculate what that number will be, but um, whatever that number is, we'll be using a portion of that um, to fund the operating budget in FY22 as we customarily um, budget every year of our free cash. We budget a certain amount in the operating budget. Mr. McNamara, did you have a follow? Um, yes, I just, I, I know you had mentioned um, uh, sort of how you're recalculating free cash and, and about how much we have, but I'm just wondering particularly how do we, how are, what is free, how does free cash get replenished? Just can you just give a little bit more of a detailed um, answer? Sure. So the replenishment of free cash is. Um, Please identify uh, yourself. Oh, Patrice Garvin, town administrator. Um, it is the overestimation of revenue and the underestimation of expenditures. So. That's how a, a, big, a large portion of the free cash is calculated um, from year over year. So we estimate a certain amount of revenue year to year. If we receive more of revenue um, in that fiscal year, then that will flow to free cash. Any additional reimbursements that we might receive during the fiscal year, that would flow to free cash. Any grant we particularly might receive, um, it will flow to free cash. So it's extra revenue that we didn't anticipate. And then it's expenditures that we didn't have to spend um, for example, if you have a really good winter and you don't expend all your snow and ice, the, the remaining snow and ice budget, will that money will flow to free cash. Mr. Dan Barry, moderator recognizes you. Hi, this is Dan Barry, uh, Precinct 1. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, echoing some of the comments made previously, I, I, I do feel it's very unfortunate we were tapping reserves uh, for the last year or two or three to close a structural deficit during a time of uh, an expanding economy and rising state aid uh, to extend by you know doubling the expected life of the 2015 override. Uh, I've noticed during the um, years I've been a town meeting member that we've been spending every year in the budget um, several million dollars over and above what we have to pay to fund current pensions um, to achieve 100% funding status on our pension obligation 11 years earlier than we legally have to uh, by 2029 instead of 2040. Um, and I know in good times, it makes sense to address, you know, long term debt issues. If things are going well, you know, I've done it. Other people do it. You go from a 30 year mortgage to a 15 year mortgage. But when things get tight again, uh, maybe it makes sense to go back to the 30 year. Um, I know doing that sort of thing, um, you know, taking the foot off the gas as far as, you know, putting, I think it's been in the neighborhood of eight to $10 million a year. Uh, extra to get that pension liability um, scheduled down to 2029 instead of 2040. But I, I, I guess I'd like to ask uh, two questions here. One, um, it has the select board or the gov town government gone to the retirement board, which is in charge of this, and I realize they're the ones who make the decision, to ask them to maybe take the foot off the gas on the, um, the goal to get our 100% funding status achieved by 2029 if they loosened up on that and said 2035, which is, I think that's where Newton is. Um, we would probably have millions of dollars freed up. Our cash, uh, free cash would be looking a lot better uh, than $2.4 million right now. And a second and final question is, uh, one upside to the downside is, um, 
bonds are going off at much lower interest rates now than they were uh, in recent years, and we have a lot of debt for the grade 7 to 12 school. Has there been any thought to refinancing that debt as a way to save some money? Thank you very much. Mr. Epstein, do you want to at least answer the first uh, or maybe both? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Roy Epstein, Chair of the Select Board and a town meeting member from Precinct 6. Uh, these questions are complicated enough that I, I will give a, as brief an, answer, brief an answer as I can. And I think some of this, this I need to hand off to Floyd Carmen. But um, the, the, um, in terms of the, what we call the amortization of the unfunded pension, it's important to realize that compared to some of our other uh, neighboring towns, uh, Belmont had a particularly large unfunded pension. We, it, um, I don't know exactly what Newton is, but I've looked at it, quite a few other towns and Belmont uh, had not made a contribution to its uh, pension fund as it should have over the years. So the accumulated liability is such that we really have to make up a, a bigger uh, deficiency than many other towns. We did stretch out the due date from 2027 to 2029, just two years ago. That is an involved process uh, with the retirement board. Uh, to extend it again, I frankly, I think is premature when we only did it two years ago. Uh, I think it's an option that should be reserved in the future uh, because we need to make as much headway uh, to uh, extinguish that liability as we can in the next few years. And if, if there's really a dire, dire emergency some years from now, I, could, I would think about stretching it out some more, but we've been kicking that, we kicked the can down the road for so many years. I just think it is a mistake to, um, use that as a further strategy right now. In terms of um, your question about interest rates, I would turn that over to uh, Mr. Carmen because he's the uh, most well-placed person in town to answer those sorts of questions. Mr. Carmen. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Floyd Carmen, you're a town treasurer. Let, let me go back to the uh, pension funding question. The recommendation to extend the pension certainly comes from the retirement board, but it has to be approved by PEREC. That is the state agency that oversees all of the pension boards. So it isn't just the town of Belmont and the retirement board decide to extend the schedule. PEREC has a big part of that. Second point I would like to make is that somewhere in the next 10 years, all of these communities are going to be confronted with mandatory OPEB funding, just like we do for the pension. And if, if the average run of the mill uh, person doesn't think that's not going to happen, they're only kidding themselves we will have mandatory funding for OPEB. So there could be a point in time where we're gonna to have to come up with an additional five, six million dollars, seven million dollars just to fund our OPEB on top of our pension. So one of the reasons that we have tried to stick to the schedule is because we know we're planning for OPEB to be a mandatory funding schedule. Let me deviate a little bit. In another lifetime, when I worked for a small company in Boston called John Hancock, I set up all of the accounting for OPEP. I set up all of the accounting for pension. And pension amortization started out in the 80s and 90s. And lo and behold, in mid-90s, we had to have mandatory OPEP. Uh, amortization schedules. I see the same thing happening happening in the municipal world. So that's all I'm going to say about OPEB. As far as uh, our debt, we just went out last year and uh, refinanced the senior center. Uh, 
There are contractual obligations when we sell these bonds. And at, at a point in time, usually around 10 years, we go back to the folks that have bought our paper and see if they're willing to uh, negotiate uh, and refinance. So that's always on my uh, to-do list every year. A couple of years from now, we'll be taking a look at the Wellington uh, Elementary School. Thank you, Mr. Carmen. Uh, Eric, Actually, uh, Mr. Moderator, if I may just make yes, one Mr. more observation. Um, Roy Epstein, Chair of the Select Board. The, the debt issued by the town is not like the mortgage you have on your house. When you, on your house, you can refinance every month if rates go down. The, we don't have the same flexibility with town debt. Once it's issued for whatever the interest rate is, that interest rate has to stay in place for some number of years before we are legally allowed to refinance the debt. So it, it is not accurate to compare it to what you do with your house. Right, thank you. Uh, we have about five people in line, so I'd like to keep this moving. Julia Jenkins, the moderator recognizes you. Hi, Julia Jenkins, Precinct 3. And I had a question about the D.A.R.E. program and I guess Officer Horan. I just saw one short announcement that the program has been cut and I didn't understand if the officer was actually cut. I can answer that. Yes, Mr. McIsaac. Is that James McIsaac, your police chief. Um, so in the school obviously needs to get advance notice of um, if the schedules are going to be changed because they need to schedule the DARE program. So uh, several weeks ago, I had discussions with Mike McAllister of the, of the school department. And I told Mike that um, personally, I'm not a, a fan of the DARE curriculum uh, itself. I think it's a, a program that has kind of run its course, but um, Mike and I spoke about the, the value of having Officer Haran up at the school, working with the lower school children, the fifth graders. And um, so we decided that we're gonna work on a curriculum together for Mike to use up at the school. But I also uh, you know, made it clear to, to Mike McAllister that due to shortages in our department in terms of staff and budget that, um, you know, in order to fill our core mission, that they should not expect to have Officer Horan at the school for the amount of time that he's been in the past. So we're working with the schools to develop a curriculum. Uh, we're gonna have him up there in the, um, basically the same capacity. It might be a hybrid. Um, I've, I've, I've reached out to DARE and asked them if they have any new curriculums that we could use that are more suited for, for issues that kids face today. And so Mike, uh, Officer Horan will be up at the, up at the Chenery Middle School um, and the schools, we've given them advance notice to expect that he probably, probably will not be able to spend the amount of time there that he's done in the past. Now, having said that, the, I had to pull the, the posting down from our, public, from our, our Facebook page because it, it was just, the, the comments were, were going through the roof. But you know, we're, we're facing budget cuts and next, next uh, FY22 is gonna be worse. So, um, you know, it, this, these are the decisions that are gonna have to be made in the town um, is, is because we need to fill our core mission. We need to be able to respond to calls in the street. And um, having somebody up at, at the middle school teaching uh, a dare is, is, you know, th those are one of the things that, that we have to look at. Thank you, Chief McIsaac. Uh, I moderator would now recognize Steve Klyomsky. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, Steve Klyomsky, Precinct 6, Chair, Light Board Advisory Committee. Um, Chair Epstein had mentioned the $5 million operating budget deficit that needed to be closed for this year. Um, and one of the ways that deficit was addressed in part was by tapping Belmont Light, the Municipal Electric Light Department, for an extra extraordinary $1 million voluntary payment. Um, the million dollars is money that the uh, Belmont Light could have used in various, for various things, including its own reserves. Uh, I understand the difficulty the town was in this year in closing deficit, 
and as a one-time uh, payment, it may make sense, but I just would caution against pursuing that policy further. Uh, as I say, Belmont Light doesn't have an unlimited amount of money and it could use the funds, uh, needs to use the funds it raises. So that was, it's just a uh, comment about future uh, voluntary payments from Belmont Light. Thank you, Mr. Klyonsky. Uh, the moderator now recognizes Mark Palillo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Hello, town meeting member, precinct eight. I have uh, two or three comments very briefly, just to go back to my, my original point about a 10 year financial plan. I also think that we need to seriously consider structural reform. Uh, this is not sustainable, this model, even though we clearly need an override and we need revenue. We certainly need to think about ways to deliver services differently, more innovatively. Uh, we've done incrementally some things around that, but I know the select board, financial task force, school committee are uh, looking at this matter. And I think we need to make this plan for the next 10 years that we're gonna continue to have this discussion. Secondly, on OPEB um, versus pension, uh, you know, fair points there. Um, the idea historically have been that we would not uh, take it, the pension funding, unfunded liability to 2040, simply to be able to redirect funds that would, would no longer be needed after 2029 for OPEB funding. I certainly think that needs to be on the table though, as well, in terms of where we go going forward as part of our plan. Um, I would be concerned, I, I think the treasurer is correct that at some point we may be mandated to fund OPEB. Um, but if you did that, every municipality other than perhaps Cambridge would be bank technically bankrupt. Um, and then finally, I do have a question for Mr. Chan. I was concerned about the comments about we're gonna, we have a real concern things are really tight. I, I thought that I had seen West and perhaps this is an offline discussion at some point, um, a, a letter from Mike Heffernan, uh, Secretary of A&F here in the state that uh, there are available funds to Belmont, upwards of 10, 2 million perhaps for FEMA reimbursement for COVID related costs. So if in fact things do come back in the fall and they may, we may see spikes. I'm worried about your comment that things are gonna get really tight. I thought that we could access additional funds under the CARES Act specifically for COVID related expenses uh, to take care of you know, whatever we need to do around first responders if people are out sick and any other sort of things that we need to bring to bear here in Belmont so as to uh, counter uh, perhaps additional infections. Thank you, Ms. Moira. Thank you, Mr. Polo. Ms. Garvin, did you want to reply or Ms. Yeah. Uh, Patrice Garvin, Town Administrator, uh, in response to Mark's comments about the additional money through the state, um, there is the CARES Act. We last week submitted funding or reimbursement for um, funds that we have expended in FY20. Um, Wes Chin mentioned earlier, we can recoup even more money until the end of the year. We are putting all COVID related expenses um, for that reimbursement. And then there is FEMA, um, which you, the town could receive 75% up to 75% in reimbursements um, for FEMA uh, designated reimbursements, which we are currently working on as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moderator recognizes Alexandra Von Giel, followed by Chris Doyle. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great, this is Alex Van Giel from Precinct 7 and um, I move the question. Unmute myself. Ms. Gale is moving the question, and um, let me check with her. May I take a brief break here? I want to check one thing with town council. I just checked um, with town council and he confirmed what I thought, namely that we have a filed amendment so we can't vote on moving the question and terminating debate and going to a motion under article nine. 
until we have uh, dispensed with the amendment filed by Julie Crockett. So we'll have to continue uh, our uh, discussion and such an, a motion would be germane after we dispensed with the amendment. Uh, I now recognize Chris Doyle and then Paul Roberts. Hi, uh, Chris Doyle, Precinct 1, um, and also in this case, a um, mem member of the Warrant Committee and specifically the Pension, OPEB, and Debt Subcommittee. And I just wanted to um, uh, make a comment about the pension discussion earlier. Dan, I think it was Dan Barry had brought up a point, and I um, I don't have a position on this right now, but I do want to mention that the POD subcommittee, <laughs> that's our acronym, um, is, is going to be looking into um, analysis related to the pension schedule. Um, it's a very major part of the um, budget and um, it, um, you know, there are pros and cons. Roy was describing some of the, the cons, um, but there are pros and cons, and um, our subcommittee of the Warrant Committee thinks that it deserves um, analysis um, from a variety of different angles. So we'll be doing that. Uh, thank you, Ms. Doyle. We have one more speaker before we turn to the amendment. Um, Paul Roberts. Thanks, uh, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> Paul Roberts from Precinct, Town Meeting Member Precinct 8. Uh, question possibly for Lori, possibly for Roy and the board selectmen, but um, given the um, uh, very constrained revenue picture, I would like an update on conversations with some of the large and um, wealthy nonprofits in town, including Belmont Hill School, uh, Belmont Day School, as well as Harvard University and McLean's about payment in lieu of taxes agreements with the town. Right now, none of those organizations pay them. Um, whereas we do require pilots or are receiving pilots from, of course, Belmont Municipal Light Department, as well as the Bel Belmont Housing Authority, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it would seem to me um, that that might be an interesting place to look. It's not going to, uh, you know, transform our revenue picture, but it could be um, a source of an extra few hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars in revenue. And I'd be interested to hear what the status of any conversations that are going on on that score are. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Uh, who wants to handle that, Mr. Epstein? Or? Uh, uh, actually, uh, Mr. Moderator, this is Roy Epstein, Chair of the Select Board. I think Patrice Garvin would be most knowledge knowledgeable about those discussions to the extent they exist. Yes, Ms. Garvin. Ms. Garvin, Town Administrator. Um, I will tell you that I have had conversations with Belmont Hill in the past. Um, they have had, um, they have sold a couple of properties over um, across from the school by the Rotary. And there was some concern that there were no taxes being paid on that property. Currently there are taxes being paid on that property. And I had a conversation with the Belmont Hill um, headmaster about potentially once those, um, once those properties come off the tax roll, um, he would be willing to engage in a conversation about a potential pilot payment for those, for those properties. Um, I will say that I know that the Warrant Committee has had a subcommittee um, looking into um, this very question about pilots and pilot payments. Um, it's something that the, the, the board and, and, and I can look at working with the Warrant Committee. But um, aside from my conversation with Belmont Hill, um, that's all the movement we've had on that subject. I would like to recognize uh, one of our assessors, Bob Reardon, Mr. Reardon. Good evening, it's Bob Reardon, Assessor, uh, also from Town Meeting Member Precinct 6. Uh, the board has been actively trying to recruit payments of in lieu of tax payments. Uh, the Lions Club does pay in lieu of tax payments. We send out letters each year requesting the information. Uh, so we are still actively working to try to get some of the organizations to make payments. So it's not, it is still being worked on. Thank you, Mr. Reardon. Um, I guess we do have one more uh, person in line, Timothy Flood. Thank you, Timothy Flood, Precinct 5. 
Um, it's been suggested that we've been uh, we're coming close to running on empty. And um, I might say that we've been running on empty for quite some time now. And I, I think everyone should be aware of that. This isn't something that's new. Uh, this is something that we've been dealing with for many years and now it's being exacerbated uh, with COVID. Um, it's, it's concerning that we're presenting it, that it's a, a new concern for the town. It's definitely not a new concern. Um, one of the things that's been discussed many times was uh, looking at cutting services. I haven't heard anyone specifically say we need to cut personnel. As hard of a conversation as that is, the reality is I think that should be part of the conversation. And lastly, uh, well, excuse me, and if someone wants to uh, respond to that in regards to uh, if personnel, if the conversation of personnel is actually being considered. Um, and then my last question or my last statement is in regards to uh, OPEB and un unfunded, excuse me, unfunded pensions. Uh, considering changing the payment schedule. Um, that's a concern because not paying that through the years is what got it to the awful position it's in. And if anyone wants to respond to the, the personnel, that would be great. Thank you, Mr. Flood. Um, Ms. Garvin, did you want to? Patrice Garvin, oh. Town Administrator. Um, in response to COVID, the select board had put in place a hiring freeze for the remaining FY20. Uh, FY um, all the current vacant positions and any vacant position that would occur between now, or when they had instituted it until June 30th, um, those would remain vacant. That was to hopefully balance some of the impact of FY um, on FY20 of COVID on the revenues um, with expenses so we wouldn't have um, a large impact to free cash. I will tell you that um, those conversations are indeed difficult. Um, we um, have a lot of unions in town. Anything that would be um, um, presented would have to be bargained. We'd have to go to the unions. That is not something that is um, done in, in a matter of weeks. Um, it's, it's a long process. Um, that process is, is being looked at and being discussed. Um, what we found is when, when COVID hit, when we had the balanced budget, COVID hit really quickly and we had a really short period of time to um, look at the revenue deficit um, for FY21. One of the goals was to balance the budget without having any layoffs. You can always um, buy more materials and things, but replacing people is a lot more difficult. Um, in FY22, we will be having similar discussions about potential layoffs and things like that. But we are, as Laurie said in her presentation, we are looking at an operating override um, to fill that deficit gap. So, like anything, layoffs will be part of that discussion. Thank you, Ms. Garvin. I rec moderator recognizes Kathy Cohen. Are you there, Kathy? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. So Kathy Cohen, precinct two town meeting member, but also chair of the library board of trustees. In the library, we have laid people off uh, in fiscal year 20. Uh, we had part-time staff. We felt it was prudent, a challenging thing to do, but in this time where we are facing such a bu budget deficit, we thought that um, we needed to do our part. We also, for the library, and we're part of human services, we're about 2.2 million of that. Uh, we are, for fiscal year 21, cutting hours, cutting materials, and, uh, and, and cutting utilities, we're gonna be turning the heat down in the library, but we are reducing hours, which will meet, have an impact to the ability to have meetings in the library, but that's the situation that we're faced with. Thank you, Ms. Cohane. Uh, Vince Stanton. Are you there, Vince? Yes, thank you, Mr. Roderator. Um, I, I think that uh, I'd just like to echo- Identify yourself. Vincent please. Stanton, town meeting member, precinct three. I think Mr. Barry's uh, suggestion had merit. I'm glad to hear that there's a subcommittee of the warrant committee that's uh, looking at the question of asking the uh, Belmont Contributory Retirement Board to extend the deadline 
the fact that Newton already has uh, scheduled their uh, pension catch-up payments out to 2035 uh, suggests that uh, other communities certainly uh, as prosperous or more prosperous than uh, Belmont are um, paying or amortizing that obligation over a longer time. I'd also like to add that accelerating the contributions um, in the present environment with the market by many, um, well, but, but in absolute terms at, a, at a record levels and, and uh, interest rates uh, um, uh, de minimis, when we're assuming, uh, I think about a seven and a half percent annual return, yet many uh, top investment firms project uh, significantly lower seven or 10 or 12 year uh, returns uh, has a, a danger that um, should be part of the discussion. In other words, it could be more conservative in a way to extend uh, Belmont's catch up payments over a longer period of time because we might make more of those contributions when um, equities are relatively less highly valued or uh, interest rates are, uh, are higher and therefore the chance of earning something approaching the assumed, uh, I think it's now, is it seven and a half or was it just reduced to seven and a, a, a 7.25% return could, could be uh, achieved. I, I also I agree with uh, Mr. Paolillo's point about uh, the, the, you know, we need to, to look at structural uh, reforms. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. San. We're now turning to the school portion of the budget. First, we'll hear a very brief statement from uh, Kate Bowen, secretary of the school committee. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm standing in for Andrea Presswich tonight who couldn't be here. Um, on behalf of the school committee, I want to express our gratitude to everyone who's I think we just lost you. I think we're waiting just a moment while Ms. Bowen is able to share her video if she chooses there? to do so. Uh, that works. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. And you can see me. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I just want to let you, I'm, I'll just restate what I said, which is that I'm standing in for Andrea Presswich, our chair who couldn't be here this evening. Um, I wanted to, on behalf of the school committee, express gratitude to everyone who has contributed to this budget these past three months. Uh, it's certainly been a trying time. And uh, for the dedicated leadership and tireless work that the school administration and all the educators and staff has shown during this difficult time, addressing student needs as efficiently and equitably and compassionately as possible um, the schools continue to be a critical service and a value to our community right now. And we are um, amazed at the resiliency of the school community and recognize uh, that there will be some critical supports that we will need going forward. It's difficult to predict every aspect of what next year will bring. However, we do know there will be significant needs and this budget represents our best effort in a rapidly changing financial landscape over these past couple of months with many meetings. We know it is less than our vision and for the school community. As such, we did as a school committee adopt a resolution this evening, which I can share uh, in the interest of the school committee, which states that the Belmont school represent a critical community service addressing the educational needs of over 4,700 children and their families. And that the meeting 
growing enrollment needs with uh, additional hiring to maintain the quality of educational outcomes for Belmont's children has been a cornerstone and commitment of the school committee and the Belmont community for several years. And whereas the level of resources available for the fiscal year 2021 budget prevent the Belmont Public Schools from maintaining level services uh, and, pre and presents a risk to the educational outcomes of our community's children. And whereas reopening the Belmont schools in the fall of 2020 under continuing coronavirus pandemic conditions pose considerable financial challenges for which available budget resources may not be sufficient. Therefore, be it resolved that the Belmont School Committee expresses its deepest reservations and concern about the FY 2021 budget for the Belmont Public Schools at a time when additional resources are needed to meet continued enrollment growth and plan for the reopening of schools in the fall under continuing COVID-19 pandemic conditions. We are grateful for the collaboration and commitment by all parties and know that we will continue to collaborate going forward. We know the state aid numbers are still evolving and they may not be as great a drop as estimated and we will respond as that picture becomes clearer um, and continue to be frugal with our spending. Uh, we do want you to know as your elected officials on the school committee, we continue to advocate at the state and federal level on behalf of public education for much needed funding. Um, public education is uh, pivoting significantly in this moment, um, but at this time, public education is a lifeline and a value that we will know for many years to come. So I turn it over to John Phelan, our superintendent, and thank the community for your support. Thank you, Ms. Bowen. Mr. Phelan. Good evening, town meeting. My name is John Phelan. I'm your superintendent of schools. Thank you for having me tonight. I first want to thank Ellen uh, O'Brien Cushman and Mike uh, Widmer and all the folks behind the scenes for being able to provide us a town meeting remotely. Uh, it's a significant achievement. Uh, and I hope everyone has been able to view uh, the full budget presentation that was sent out earlier by the town clerk's office. As um, Secretary uh, Kate Bowen suggested, the school committee, the select board, the Warren committee, the capital committee, town administration have all contributed to the budget. Uh, for the town and the schools next year, and we appreciate their support. Uh, the budget that you're about to see is 1.4% larger in FY21 than it was in FY, excuse me, than it was in FY20. Uh, next slide, please. We do have two uh, challenges that we always like to represent, uh, and they're known challenges that we uh, continue to uh, try to make progress on in Belmont. The first is the historical trend of enrollment increasing year after year. Uh, we continue to see those increases each year uh, and this year was no exception and we believe that will continue up and through 2025-26 school year. The second challenge that we face is the per pupil expenditure needs that we have in the next slide where we see in the uh, screen that you have uh, that the Belmont Public Schools uh, spend significantly less than the, top, than the state average uh, and also significantly less than the cohort of schools that in districts that we like to compare ourselves to. So with these two challenges, uh, we have been able to have great success over the last few years with our uh, override funds that we had uh, discovered in, and had the benefit of in 2015. And we continue, continue to make progress towards the end of reducing class size and also caseload for our teachers and our students. Uh, in the next slide, you'll be able to see that in partnership with the town, uh, we uh, originally made an FY21 draft budget, which you'll see in the column marked FY21 draft budget one. Um, the FY20 uh, budget was $60,649,451. Um, and in that original budget, we had some rollover of the existing uh, staff obligations in some strategic plan cost drivers uh, that we were able to add, um, as well as some reductions in special education tuitions that we decided to uh, partner with the town on to reduce the original budget. Uh, when COVID hit, uh, we needed to make an adjustment. Uh, the entire town needed to partner on reducing uh, the expenses in contributing to the revenue gap that we were going to see from the state and at the local level. Uh, we believe it was in the long-term interest of the town and the schools to be able to mitigate FY21 as best we could uh, so we could put our eyes towards FY22. 
So the middle column uh, in this uh, chart shows that we have reduced the school budget uh, by another $1,020,800 uh, with the hope of providing a budget that we can use to um, support our students moving forward next year. In the next slide, you'll see some COVID related assumptions that we'd like to make uh, very explicit uh, for the town to let them know that we're trying to utilize all the funds we have in a way uh, that will be flexibly used to address whatever situation we have in FY21, especially as it relates to opening school in November. The first is our new operational requirements are related to health, safety, and the wellness of our students and staff and how we can address remote learning. We're very fortunate to be able to use some of the FY20 funds that we had that we were not fully expending due to not being in school. And we were able to expend those dollars on devices so we could have one-to-one uh, -one devices in every child's home in Belmont. That would be in the case that we are a hybrid school next year or a remote learning school. We also were able to purchase PPE materials and supplies through our facilities department led by Steve Dorrance and Anthony uh, DeCologiero so our students and staff could be safe next year when we did open school and we hope to open school with students in it if we can. And lastly, we know that this FY21 budget uh, for every town department uh, is a challenge. And we, uh, along with the school committee's hard work, uh, will look to use this FY21 budget uh, as it was voted last week to uh, pivot in any way needed in September or even August to secure or rearrange lines of our budget to make sure that we have the safety models in place and the learning tools in place to ensure a safe and engaging environment for our students. So we appreciate our flexibility uh, that we had with expending, expending FY20 dollars uh, to support FY21. And we also know that despite our increased enrollment and our low per pupil expenditure, we have gained by over 40 positions in the last five years with the benefit of the override. Uh, and we would like to continue to incrementally add our staff because we know our students are being added at a higher level, but this may not be the year that we could do that. So lastly, uh, in the next slide, the Belmont School Committee and School Department are recommending and requesting that the town meeting vote and approve the FY21 general fund budget of $61,485,641. And as stated earlier in the Warren Committee report, this does not include the estimated state and federal grants and revolving fees, which are budgeted at another $9,799,793, a result in the total school budget of $71,285,434. Uh, thank you very much for your time and your, and your support. Uh, this year has been a very unique year for the town of Belmont and the state of Massachusetts in our country. And I can't thank our teachers enough and our families and our students for their flexible approach to our closing of school, our shift to remote learning and our and the patience they're showing as we pivot to next year's opening in September. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Phelan. Uh, we now turn to the amendment of, by Julie Crockett, of Precinct 5. Um, before I recognize Ms. Crockett, let me make two points. Her, um, this is a simplified version of her original amendment. The content is the same. so. Uh, this is the amendment that we will uh, uh, the, read into the record tonight. Secondly, I want to be clear. I'm not obviously this has nothing to do with whether my comment whether the amendment should be adopted or not. But uh, this issue has come up, namely that um, Ms. Crockett is making her amendment because she has specific purposes for which she would like to spend the additional 366 thousand dollars but the uh, according to state law town meeting cannot allocate those dollars so if the amendment were approved it would be up to the school committee to determine where that money would go so with that clarification uh, I would call on Ms. Crockett to make her amendment and brief explanation Excuse me, Mr. Minute. Moderator. This is Meg. We have a point of order question from Aaron Pickalingus, Precinct 6. Yes, by all means. What is the point of order? Aaron, can you unmute yourself? Hi, this is Aaron Pickalingus from uh, Precinct 6. 
I'm just wondering, uh, why didn't we debate the amendment before debating the original article? We debate the amendment because it, it ties to the school budget. It's, and, I'm, I guess, oh, so it's, it's about this, not this, art, the main article, it's the sub article. I divided the debate on Article 9 into two parts, non-school and school. And since her amendment applies to the schools, yeah. we're leading off the discussion of the schools with her amendment. Great, thank you. You're welcome. So, Ms. Crockett? Julie Waiting Crockett, you can share your video and your audio, please. Thank you. Julie Crockett, Town Meeting Member Precinct 5. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Right. I do not see my video, but either way is fine. Uh, Julie Crockett, Town Meeting Member Precinct 5, moved that the motion for Article 9, Fiscal Year 2021, Budget appropriation and transfer balances to the Go ahead. 21 budget be amended to change the number after the words Belmont Public Schools from $61,485,641 to $61,851,641. And the number after the words from other fund balance pre from $3,792,665 to $4,158,665. Now let's move to a short explanation of the amendment. Next slide. Again, Julie Crockett, I'm the member of Precinct 5. And transfers $366,000 to the school department from free cash. These funds would be made available on July 1, 2020. I want to briefly address three questions. One, why exactly $366,000? Two, what does it mean to transfer funds from free cash? Three, why do we need to decide now? First, why $366,000? $366,000 represents four teachers at the Chenery Middle School, where both sixth and seventh grades are at 400 students each. An additional English, math, science, and social studies teacher would reduce team size or the caseload per teacher from 133 to 114 students. This was the number one priority of the school committee, and it was the very last item removed from their fiscal year 21 budget due to what Belmont anticipated would be a 25% cut in state aid. Second, what does it mean to transfer funds from free cash? The unreserved fund balance or free cash is money that's unallocated. It's free to move. Every year, town meeting goes through the process of moving free cash to places we need it. This fiscal year, we started with 8.1 million in free cash. That's what the pie chart shows. At our special town meeting in November, we approved and moved $1.5 million to the General Stabilization Fund, shown in yellow on the upper left of the chart. Tonight, we will definitely move $3.79 million for the fiscal year 21 budget. That's shown in gray. This amendment, if adopted, would mean after tonight, $2.04 million shown in blue will be the remainder in free cash. Note that I did ask our town treasurer, Floyd Carmen, and if more state aid comes in than we anticipated for fiscal year 2021, above the 25% projected cuts, that money goes into free cash. But those funds appropriated because transfers from free cash require a majority vote of town meeting. Now to the last point. Why do we need to decide now? We are here tonight as town meeting members because we have to approve the budget. It's town meeting's job to finalize and vote on the budget. Town meeting members need to make a choice. Are we going to leave these funds in free cash until town meeting can convene again in mid-September? Or will we make it available to the school department and school committee as they prepare for the upcoming school year? It is town meeting's responsibility to finalize and approve the budget 
And without deciding where this $366,000 belong, we as town meeting have not finished our job. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Crockett. Let me um, report the votes on this amendment. The select board voted zero in favor, three opposed. The warrant committee voted two in favor, 11 opposed. The school committee voted three in favor and one opposed uh, and one absent. So with those votes, we'll now open the discussion. Uh, and Michael Crowley, I believe you were first. Uh, Mike Crowley, town meeting member, precinct eight and school committee member. Um, I'm speaking in favor of the amendment to transfer 366,000 from free cash to the school budget. Um, we need the funding to assist with reopening the schools in the fall. The school committee voted tonight in favor of the budget. Um, no, I'm sorry, the school committee voted in favor of the budget you're considering today, but we also voted three to one in favor of this amendment. Um, as one member of the school committee, I can tell you that we've struggled with this budget and, and I know that, that you know, the school committee doesn't have a high degree of confidence that it meets our needs for the coming year. And, and yet I think that we all realize that the school committee has a legal obligation to vote a budget. The thing that I think that we failed to realize that if we had voted no on the budget last week, it wouldn't have created chaos, but it would have simply forced everyone back to the negotiating table, something that happens in many other towns and something that, you know, frankly, I think should have happened here, but we didn't realize that. So. Now I'm hoping that town meeting will lend a hand and, and help with additional resources that really are needed for school reopening in the fall and vote yes on the budget amendment. And let, let me just say that, you know, the school budget, even in ordinary times is, is lean, far more so than it, it needs to be. We're struggling with enrollment increases. Um, you know, we've been adding staff for several years, but our student to teacher ratios are still higher than they were before the last recession. And, and they're at their worst at the Chenery Middle School where we have far too much crowding. Now we're confronted with how to reopen schools in the fall with, you know, the, the, pot, the, the probability that we'll, we'll be limited to 10, 10, I'm sorry, 10 kids in the classroom. Um, and no additional resources in what's less than a level resources budget to do that. So I just don't think it's possible to do it safely without additional resources. Um, Thank I, I, I know that some here will be worried about disrupting a delicate budget balancing act um, and a budget th that's been carefully negotiated, but um, I don't think 366,000 for the schools um, is going to destroy anybody's hard work, and it and it could take us a great deal down the it could take us um, uh, far down the road towards reopening in the fall. Um, I I, I also have you know voice minute mark, Mr. Crowley. All right, well, thank you. I just hope the we have eight people in line here, so I'm. Uh, I hope we can be as brief as possible. Um, Heather Rubeski, the moderator recognizes you. Heather Rubeski, Precinct 7, town meeting member. Um, no questions, but I have a quick statement to make. The current crisis has forced our schools into a position where they have to do more with less. This is my true north as I vote in favor of this amendment. Serving the needs of our public school students is not a situation where you can just wait and make up for it later on. Academic regression and increased social and mental health needs caused directly by this year's school closure and pandemic will already increase and cause a cascading, costly and lingering impact on our current students for possibly the rest of their K-12 career. This here and now in our classrooms is an unanticipated need as Lori Slap of the Warrant Committee just told us earlier we should use our free cash funds for. No one could have told us last fall our students would be out of school, but now our students are actively experiencing an unanticipated need. 
As the parent of three, including one in special education, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that despite heroic teaching and parenting, some of our students will return to school in the fall with immense regression and require an immense investment by the district. Yet we have made a very conservative cut that may well go beyond what was needed, directly decreasing the quality of the education our children receive in a year when they need the best we can deliver. We are already facing increased costs to deal with simply the health restrictions imposed on us by the epidemic, purchasing supplies, maintaining health standards. This revised budget takes an additional step that means we're also not addressing pre-existing needs. Waiting until September does not allow the district to consider adding positions, whether they are at the middle school, high school, or across the district for crisis management. And if needed for resources, this prevents a delay in providing those resources at the beginning of the school year. $366,000 does not come close to solving our district's problems, but it's a plug we can stick in the hole of the dam to hopefully help hold it together. And if ever there was unusual circumstances to go below the free cash guidelines, now is the time. We're already facing the need for a significant override to support the schools and the town as a whole for fiscal year 22 and beyond. But our students require services now, and there's an opportunity tonight to spend $366,000 and save higher costs to address accumulated student needs later on. I consider this spending a dime now to save a dollar later. We may not have heard a lot of support of people spe speaking strongly in favor of this amendment, but I argue that the select board, the warrant committee, and others have already bought into the revised budget that was presented to us tonight, however reluctant they were to make cuts, and they feel responsibility to stick to their word, so to speak. Our students don't get the opportunity to speak tonight to support their needs. However, now you and I get our turn to vote, and I use my vote to support the critical and urgent needs of our students and our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Raveski. Uh, Jeff Lubian, moderator recognizes you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeff Lubian, um, Town Meeting Member of Precinct 7, member of the Warrant Committee, and the Warrant Committee re representative to the Financial Task Force. Uh, I'm recommending unfavorable action for this, even though I do have a daughter that will be going into the sixth grade, and I fully appreciate the challenges that we face. Um, the main reasons for that are, first of all, we are tapping into free cash at the highest amount we've ever had to balance the budget at $3.8 million. To bring it down even further before below the guidelines, I think puts a significant risk at being able to adjust for challenges that come in the future. And, the, and I'm always of the belief that the fiscal 21 budget is going to have to be revisited in the fall anyway, because of the challenges with COVID. So I think it would be detrimental to lower that even further with this amendment. More importantly, being on the financial task force, and many of you have heard this tonight from others, is that this use of one-time funds has put us in a very dire situation for fiscal 22. We are facing a significant fiscal cliff and using one-time funds like free cash to plug holes in the budget just continues to compound that cliff. So any of these adjustments we do do this year with free cash adds to that fiscal deficit. We need to have a financial pivot where we make sure that reoccurring revenues match reoccurring expenses and not are dependent on one-time funds. And so the time is now to start making that pivot and even though it might only be 366,000, we have to start making these tough decisions. And therefore I suggest to you, the voters that we vote um, on favorable action for this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lubian. There are 11 speakers in line, FYI. Elaine Allison, <laughs> you're next, followed by Paul Roberts. Elaine. Okay, here I am. Um, Elaine Alley, good uh, precinct five uh, town meeting member and vice chair of the library board of trustees. I also have grave concerns about this uh, budget amendment. And I at, our, at the League of Women Voters meeting, we heard that a lot of the town non-union staffs and the department heads are not taking raises or colas. And I'm wondering what the school can do on their end, um, if, the, if they can do anything to follow suit. This is a financial error that's unprecedented for all of us. And we've seen the town administrator turn down a, a raise and departments like the library, we've been laying off part-time staff and 
you know, it's, it's unsure, unclear what's going to happen going forward. And so uh, can you speak to the salaries of the teachers in FY21? And uh, is there some wiggle room there? What can we expect? John Phelan, Superintendent of Schools. Mr. Phelan. Uh, we have been in negotiations with our uh, teachers union uh, for the entire 2019-20 school year. Uh, we were probably almost 75% uh, complete uh, when COVID hit and those uh, discussions regarding the contract uh, for the next three years had to cease. Uh, we are in active mode currently to see if we can uh, bring that to a close uh, for uh, at least for the next year. Uh, and that um, negotiation is ongoing uh, as we speak uh, with attorneys speaking and meeting with the union. Thank you. I'd like to recognize Lori Slapp, Chair of the Warren Committee. Uh, Lori Slapp, Chair of the Warren Committee and Town Meeting Member Precinct 6. I think a lot of the points that I wanted to raise have been uh, discussed already. I won't prolong them. I strongly am in opposition to this amendment. I think the, there was a lot of work done this spring and six weeks, as was pointed out before, with the town administrator, the school superintendent, school committee, select board, Warren Committee. We all worked together to arrive at this budget. I certainly acknowledge that it's very difficult that there really no one is receiving level services across the board. And I do think it's really critical to leave the funds in free cash when there is so much uncertainty. Um, as Jeff said, we may need to revisit this again in the fall, but I don't think this is the time to move anything out of free cash to the school budget. Thank you. Uh, recognize Paul Roberts and then Sue Bass. Hey there, everybody. This is Paul Roberts, town meeting member, precinct day chair of the town's IT advisory committee. I'm standing virtually in support of this motion, um, and uh, I see three strong arguments for supporting it. Um, the first, of course, is that this is a public health issue. There are the, the health and safety of our children is at stake. While we don't know exactly what the guidance from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is regarding return to school in the fall, in all likelihood, it will require smaller class sizes, more distancing between students, and a healthy amount of PPE, personal protective equipment. This money, $366,000 out of an $8 million free cash fund, goes directly to that problem. It adds four teachers in our most crowded grades with the express purpose of lowering density and crowding by about 20 students per team in the, in the sixth and seventh grades. That is gonna give the school district more flexibility to allow our kids to go back to school in classrooms. I have three children. My middle daughter just graduated from Belmont High. My youngest is going into sophomore year of, of high school. They have been isolated at home for three months for their education as well as their mental health, they need to return to classrooms in the fall. This is $366,000 out of 8 million in free cash to make that more possible. It is a shame that we are sitting here quibbling over money when the core issue here is preventing another COVID outbreak and allowing our students back into the classroom. Give me a break. Second, transfers like this are not unusual. As a school committee member in 2009, during the Great Recession, town meeting voted, I, I was a school committee member at the time, town meeting voted to transfer $175,000 directly to the public school budget for the fiscal year 2010 budget. It was, uh, we heard the same exact arguments from Warren Committee, who voted unanimously against it. We heard the same exact arguments for the Board of Selectmen, who were outraged, but we transferred $175,000, and guess what? The wheels of government did not drag to a, to a halt. There was no uh, breaking of covenants within you know, Belmont's government. We simply used the money as it was directed as the school, the, the school department and life went on. And that's what will happen here, okay? And the final argument I'm gonna make is that we are talking in the context of a town and school budget that are critically underfunded. I appreciate and I'm thankful to hear Selectman Epstein and others talk about the need for an override. But by God, we needed it three years ago. We are now in a dire situation. And, um, you know, the, uh, the reality is 
We are well below the state average in per pupil spending to the term of about $3,000 per student. And we're in the lowest sex tent in terms of property taxes per $100,000 of assessed property value. There's a lot of money that isn't in this system. That is the root source of all of our problems. And I think we do need to address it. I love that we're talking about it, but we need to make it happen. And the sooner, the better. So I ask you for your support in this. Um, education is core to our mission as a town. It is the number one bullet item in our Vision 21 statement. Um, and I think we need to now put our money literally where our mouth is, support this amendment and support our students and give our educators every tool possible to get our students back in the classroom in the fall. And I really do hope you'll join me in voting for this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Sue Bass, you're next. Uh, yes, I'm Sue Bass from a uh, town meeting member from precinct three. And let me start by saying that I have no children in the Belmont public schools or in any other school, and I never have had, but I believe in public education in a serious approach to public education. I have been, since I've lived in the 25 years I've lived in Belmont, I have been shocked at the teacher pupil ratio in, in Belmont the low per student spending. We, as a friend of mine said, we get our reputation. Our reputation rests on the gene pool of the parents, not on what we actually provide in the school system. I hope we don't, aren't even worse, but um, this is a symbol. This four teachers, four full-time equivalent teachers uh, for the most crowded uh, group of students, the most crowded school, the most crowded uh, uh, classes, it's just a symbol. It doesn't transform the fundamental situation that, that class sizes are way too large. Uh, people who can afford it, who live in Belmont, they, they pay many thousands more dollars to send their kids to a school that'll have, you know, 15 class size instead of 26 or 30. But, you know, we can't do everything. We, it's worth making the symbolic gesture of saying, yes, this is really important. And yes, these, these uh, kids should get a better education and we should, we should spend a few bucks. I mean, $366,000 is, is not a ton of money out of our budget. We should spend a few bucks more to see that they get a better education than they would otherwise. So I urge you to vote for this. Uh, it's a symbol, but it's an important symbol. And, um, you know, we'll figure out, we'll have to plan better in the future. Thank you. We need to take a uh, brief break court, uh, for the recorder, but as every two hours, I need to tell people that there are 19 speakers in line. And uh, so I would strongly urge you to keep your comments. To, I mean, there are only so many points that one needs to make, uh, and I urge you not to repeat over and over the same point. So if we can concentrate on having each of you speak for one minute and make the point, and then that would be great. We can hear from everybody. So we'll take a brief break. Thank you.
33 town meeting members on Zoom at the moment. There you go. My battery's running low. I'm plugged in. I guess so. All right, we will resume the discussion of the amendment under uh, Article 9. Uh, let me make it. Can you change the screen there, Glenn? Glenn? All right, we will continue the discussion. Um, I want town meeting members to know what my plan is. Uh, we've got 234 town meeting members um, still with us on Zoom, and other department heads and so forth. So we got 300 people right now participating in this uh, town meeting. And so I have every intention to complete action tonight and not have us come back, no matter how late it goes, and not come back on Thursday. Uh, following Article 9, we really have just the two CPA articles, uh, and then the Article 12 is, is a formality. So I'm, uh, I do want you to know that we're going to complete action, but uh, there are some 21 or two people in line to speak on this amendment. So uh, again, I would dearly urge you to keep your comments, if possible, to one minute, and uh, let's keep this um, focused and and done as expeditiously as possible. Uh, and uh, the next speaker is Jessica Hausman, followed by Ji Yun Wang. Ms. Hausman. Pardon me, I, pardon me, I made a mistake. Deb Lockett, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Deb Lockett, Precinct 7. Um, besides the concern that maybe free cash might be uh, reduced to some floor, uh, which I'm actually not sure what that number might be. I'd like to hear from some of the departments of why they are voting against this um, amendment. So uh, I would ask um, Ms. Slapp, I guess, and Ms. Mr. Epstein, why don't you start? Yeah, can, can I part? start? Um... You know, as, as you've all heard, Roy, Roy Epstein, chair of the select board and town meeting member from Precinct 6. Um, as you've already heard, uh, this budget was the subject of discussion and work for weeks by a large number of people. And the issues addressed by this amendment were thoroughly discussed and analyzed and we reconciled, I thought, all the competing demands on the funds that we had. And um, there's been no new information since our budget agreement was achieved at the end of May. That This amendment, uh, everything in this amendment was already discussed and the school superintendent agreed, and you just heard the school superintendent say that they recommend a budget that is in the main motion. And I have to tell you that when we had so much uh, agreement amongst the parties, it, it really feels like, uh, like a betrayal uh, to have an agreement and then have it broken this evening. And as far as I'm concerned, put us back in square one. So it, it's a broken process. Uh, the budget, it, you've heard a lot of misinformation already. There is not $8 million in free cash. The, there are just many factual errors that you've heard. And I, I can tell you that the budget that was put together was one that the school that the school superintendent and the school committee agreed to just two weeks ago. So I- Moderate a point of order. Please uh, identify yourself. This is Dan Kane from the town clerk staff. Uh, on yes, behalf of uh, someone named Dan Steve. And what is the point of order, Mr. King? Uh, they have not indicated. Please unmute yourself, please. Okay. 
So the um, person known as Dan Steve, would you please identify yourself? Um, when voting, it says Dan Stevens. Um, sorry Thank about you. that. Um, Precinct four, town meeting member. Um, so we've been limited to one minute um, per person, or we've actually three minutes, but asked to keep it to one minute. Hi. Um, if we ask a question, is the amount of time uh, given, you know, for response, is that limited to one minute or three minutes, or is it three minutes per person who the moderator recognizes to speak? Well, I've asked people, I, I set the limit of three minutes, and so that is the limit. I am simply encouraging everybody to be as brief as possible because we have 21 people in, in line. So, um, but this is an, so I try to make a, a judgment here. Understood. But, Understood. That's a recommendation. But is the um, the total time of the responses of the the people that we ask questions of also limited to three minutes, or is it unlimited? No, it's limited to three minutes. Okay. Thanks. Well, and I, and I appreciate Thanks, everybody. So I I I, 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 I thank you. I I have said the main things on my mind. Thank you. And Ms. Slaps, did you want to add anything to your earlier comments? Say us for the two departments, two committees that voted against this. I think the comments that you heard, <clears throat> excuse me, that I made earlier, Laurie Slap, I'm chair of the Warren Committee, and from Jeff Lubian pretty much spell out the conversation that we had yesterday at the Warren Committee meeting. Um, I agree with Mr. Epstein, it was a very long, prolonged uh, a very prolonged negotiation process, if you will, over the last few weeks. And I think it's a very difficult budget as you've seen for all departments across the board. And while I am extremely sympathetic to the school department um, and to the schools in general, I think that we have to stick within the budget for FY21. And for those who want to increase the school budget, I would encourage everyone to work as hard as they can for an override next year. Thank you. We'll now turn to Jessica Hausman, Ms. Hausman. Jessica Hausman, um, Precinct 1, Town Meeting Member. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, excellent. Um, I am in strong support of this amendment. Um, I believe uh, my, my understanding was that this um, budget was uh, created when we expected around a 25% drop in state aid. And can Will Brownsberger give us an update um, from the State House if that drop is still going to be? Um, that large? Mr. Brownsberger, are you on? Well, I'm not. I don't think he is. Well, any, if he is, he's not picking up. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any information? I heard there may have been, you know, whisperings of just five to ten percent as like very recent numbers as of today. Um, so I think that's a really vital piece of information if somebody, if if someone's considering this. I think Mr. Brownsberger is on now. Is he? Well. We're trying to get Mr. Brownsberger. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are, Will. Hi, uh, the status is that we are still in a condition of great uncertainty about what the um, state, the federal government will do. Uh, and so that we, the state really doesn't know how much money will be available for state budgeting purposes. You know, we have the ability to go to a one twelfth type budget and, and just because we can sort of budget on a more rolling basis. And that is what we are likely to do because we just don't know where the feds are. Um, 
I think I think a 25% cut is certainly a worst case cut. Um, numbers that I've heard are uh, for total state aid are not quite as bad as that, uh, as as guesses. Uh, but I think the town is taking a uh, conservative position in a, in a time of uncertainty. It is possible that the picture could be better than that. Uh, I hesitate to pick a number, but it would, I, if I had to pull a number out of the air, it would probably end up being something like a 10% cut in total state aid as likely. But uh, that is just totally a condition of uncertainty. And so that the town needs to consider that uh, range of uncertainty. And I think be prepared for the possibility that if things come out better, then then you could revisit it um, with a with a subsequent distribution of funds. Thank you, Will. That was for the record. That was Will Brownsberger, our state senator. I now would uh, ask Ji Yun Wang to speak. There are eighteen people in line. Ji Yun Wang, precinct eight. Um, two questions for Superintendent Valen. One. Um, has COVID changed the predictions of how many students will be enrolled for this coming year? And two, question about the devices. Uh, you had mentioned that uh, there, this, the committee is planning to, to purchase enough devices uh, to, to give one to all students, if I understand correctly. Uh, I believe that many students, a significant number of students probably have enough devices and, and certainly if I had to choose between uh, getting a device and putting that money into um, an FTE, I would much rather put that money into the FTE and not get a device because we have the devices we need at home. So I was just wondering, is that a possibility of trying to transfer some of the tech money um, to the FTEs? Thank you. Mr. Phelan. John Phelan, Superintendent of Schools. Gee, thank you for the question. Uh, we are using our FY20 dollars to purchase the devices. Um, I, I believe that we heard loud and clear from our community that uh, if we were in the need to pivot again to remote learning or even uh, a hybrid model where students would learn from home part of the day and be in school part of the day, that uh, synchronous learning and teaching would have to happen. And for that to take place, we would need a device uh, in every student's hands. Uh, in a family that may have two or three children, they would need two or three devices because uh, what we found and learned this year is that when students have to share a device, we cannot have teachers set a time for them to have their lesson uh, and engage in the lesson in a way uh, that's live and active. So um, we too prefer teachers over devices in normal circumstances. I just don't believe that we are in normal circumstances. Uh, and second to that, uh, in part of this larger question about how we fund uh, the town, um, adding staff uh, as opposed to the devices in this case, is also adding uh, reoccurring revenue uh, or reoccurring expenses to our budget uh, with, with one-time funds. And so we're, we're trying to balance the needs of our you know, short-term town budget uh, planning uh, with where we are at the school. So I, I would prefer to make sure that if we have to pivot remotely, we have the devices to, uh, to do so. And I believe our community expects that to be the case as well. Thank you, Mr. Phelan. I now recognize Joe Bernard, followed by Alina Lozanti. Mr. Bernard. Joe Bernard, town meeting member, precinct three. Um, it's unfortunate that I have to start out by saying that town meeting is not just a rubber stamp. And I'm sorry if some feel that the process is broken or they feel betrayed, but we are here serving the purpose that we were elected to serve. Um, I don't have children at Chenery, but I feel very strongly class size is averaging over 30 students per class is just unacceptable for Belmont schools. And there's other downstream implications of that. And this should raise a big red flag. It should make us revisit budget decisions and specifically avoiding all layoffs and freezing all hiring. Uh, I have no doubt <clears throat> that these decisions were well-intentioned. I appreciate that layoffs are difficult. It's difficult to let good people go and it's difficult when you technically have to honor uh, a union agreement, that's true. Uh, but having said that, the point I wanna make that hasn't been made here yet is that we specifically stated one of the goals of our budget is avoiding layoffs and that should not be in itself one of the goals of the budget. Um, that does not necessarily provide the best outcome for the town. Um, 
when we avoid layoffs and freeze hiring, we're not looking forward. We're looking backward. We're saying that Belmont's needs in the future are exactly the positions that are staffed today, no more, no less. And I don't believe that can be a true statement if the end result is class sizes over 30 students. Um, so I support this amendment. I think this is a solution to the most glaring problem in the budget. And when we talk about making tough decisions, we need to talk about optimizing the budget and not just balancing it by implementing a hiring freeze. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. Ms. Lasanke. Can you unmute your microphone? One moment, Ms. Lasanke. So he can unmute. Looks like I can unmute now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Um, Alina, thank you, Precinct One. At the start of this amendment, uh, Mr. Moderator reminded us that the school department has discretion for how they spend their funds. So my question is for Mr. Phelan. If we were to vote in favor of this amendment, would you anticipate going ahead with posting these four open positions, in fact, and proceeding with hiring these four teachers for sixth and seventh grade to start in September? Or do you think your approach would be to wait and see how else to or how to in generally spend this money? Um, Mr. Phelan. John Phelan, superintendent of schools, thank you for the question. We uh, created two lists of needs for next year. Uh, one list uh, was of the known challenges of enrollment uh, and these four positions were at the top of that list. The other list were COVID related uh, needs that we had for next year. Uh, and so we uh, not understanding what challenges we'll face until we hear from the state and get the guidelines of how to open school uh, and implement some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, my recommendation would be to pause uh, and wait to see what September looks like uh, and make decisions in a more flexible manner with the funds as opposed to hiring them tomorrow uh, for the known need of, of the grade six and seven enrollment. Uh, we, we do have to be very uh, conservative with our approach to make sure that whatever funds we're expending, we're doing it in a way that serves the most acute need next year. And quite frankly, we're, we're still waiting for some state guidance and we're still waiting for the health data to point us in that direction. So I would wait and pause. Next speaker is Ellen Schreiber. Moderator recognizes Ms. Schreiber. Yes, hi. Mike, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is uh, Ellen Schreiber, uh, town meeting member, precinct eight, member of the warrant committee. Um, I wanna start by saying that I agree with uh, things that have been said. Education is absolutely core to our mission. Um, uh, yes, we are absolutely underfunded. Uh, we absolutely need the money. We have great needs. We need more people, uh, more teams for the students at Chenery. Yes, 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 yes. I have two students uh, in Chenery and in the high school. So I understand uh, the feeling and, and the personal impact of it. All of that said, I am strongly opposed to this amendment. I feel that we are taking way too big a risk by allocating more money from free cash. You know, free cash isn't free. Free cash is our rainy day fund. It's our savings. $2 million is underneath our floor. Our floor is 3%. And $2 million takes us under that. We don't have $8 million. We've already spent some of that. We're already allocating 3.8 million of that for this budget. This is an enormous risk. There are many uncertain things that are coming our way. What happens if we wind up having to spend a lot of free cash? We're also at a risk because we do not know how free cash is going to replenish this year. We've spent free cash. We have taken a hit in our revenue with COVID. We don't know how much we're gonna have once the rating comes in in October. And I just wanna add one other thing. I've, had, I've heard uh, our town treasurer 
uh, refer to our free cash level, our reserves level is one of the things the rating agencies look at when they give us our rating. We were just uh, reaffirmed as a AAA um, town by both ratings agencies, which saved us over $7 million in the borrowing we just did. You take it uh, free cash any lower than where it is, we risk that. That's $7 million dollars in this case, is money the taxpayers do not have to pay. So all of that said, I really want more money for the schools. I really understand the risks and the needs and how difficult it's going to be next year. But it, in my mind, it's an unacceptable risk. Thank you. Thank you. Heather Barr is the next speaker. I recognize Heather Barr. Heather, please unmute yourself. Your mic is open, we can hear you. Please state your name and your precinct. We'll come back to Heather. Um, Steve Klyansky, you're next in line. Moderator recognizes you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Klyansky, Precinct 6. I move the question. <laughs> Mr. Klyansky has moved the question, which would terminate debate on the amendment. Let me double check. So to clarify, the motion to terminate debate um, takes a two-thirds vote. So we'll, we'll vote momentarily. This is terminating debate on our, on the amendment, Ms. Crockett's amendment. If we terminate debate on the amendment, we then go to the full motion. If we don't terminate debate on the amendment, we then continue debating the amendment. Uh, and uh, so we will go to the vote. This takes a two thirds majority. If you favor terminating debate on the amendment, vote yes. If you do not, vote no. And the polls are open. I'll give another uh, 10 seconds on the voting. All right. If you haven't voted, please vote now. All right. Let's close the polls. The motion to terminate debate, two thirds required, carries 209. 
to 42 opposed with five abstentions. And Ellen, do you have a couple of others? Yes, Mr. Moderator, Ellen O'Brien Cushman, town clerk. We have emergency votes. Kathy Kahane, precinct two, votes yes. Thomasina Olson, precinct five, votes yes. Joel Samuels, precinct six, votes yes. Suzanne Bloor, precinct five, votes yes. A total of four additional yes votes. So that's so that four additional four yeses, yeses, yeses to the total, which was... Two oh nine. So it was two oh nine. So two thirteen. Yes. Forty two. No. Five abstentions. So finish scrolling because we'll now go with the termination of debate. What we'll do now is. Um, vote on the amendment itself. So we can finish this, Glenn. We'll go directly now to the vote on the amendment. So that was to terminate debate, to be absolutely clear for everybody. We'll now vote on Ms. Crockett's amendment to add 366,000. So if to the school budget from free cash. So if you support our amendment, vote yes. If you're opposed, vote no. And the polls are open. Mr. Moderator, we have a point of order from Jill Clark. Yes, Ms. Clark, your point of order. Uh, Jill Clark, Precinct 7. It appears from the polling that we're voting on Article 9, not the amendment to Article 9. I just wanted to clarify that. I think at the top it says Crockett Amendment, at least with the screen that I'm looking at. It says Article it 9, Crockett Amendment. Are you looking at it? I'm looking at the turning the turning point website. I see. Okay. Um, yeah, the Zoom has the Crockett Amendment. But, okay. As long as we're okay. all voting on the same thing, that's fine. Right. Well, I appreciate uh, that heads up. So make sure everybody understands. Yes, we're voting on the Crockett Amendment. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Thank you. Give it about 10 more seconds. All right, Glenn, when you close the polls, display the result. The vote is 89 in favor, 167 opposed. Three abstentions, and Ms. Cushman. Ellen O'Brien Cushman, town clerk. I have two emergency votes on the amendment to Article 9 by Ms. Crockett. Joel Samuels, Precinct 6, voted yes. Thomasina Olson, Precinct 5, voted no. I would add one to each side. 
So that would add one. So 90 in favor, 168 opposed. So the amendment is defeated and three abstain. So we'll scroll through the votes here for a moment and then we'll turn to uh, back to the main motion under article nine. We've covered all the non-schools. We've had a lot of comment on the schools. But if there are any more comments, obviously, that is, uh, that is appropriate. So, all right. We now turn to the next speaker, Ann Helgen. I'm sorry, I thought we uh, were not, I, I lowered my hand. I thought we were oh. not discussing the amendment any further. We're not, so okay. that was, so I guess only raise your hand if you want to talk about the, uh, the budget itself. Oh yeah, no, she said no. Ann Helgen, we note you have raised your hand again. Would you like to now speak on the main motion? Okay. So Michael McNamara, I think you're next. Uh, thank you. Uh, Michael McNamara, Tommy member, Precinct 7. Um, I just want to make my really quick point. Um, I saw that in the school budget, there was cuts to special education tuitions um, the budget originally had money for it, maybe about $100,000, I believe the slide that was shown by uh, the superintendent Phelan. So I was wondering, what exactly is that money for? How is it used and why was it cut? Mr. Phelan? John Phelan, superintendent of schools. Um, back in January, uh, we met with the town and when we were originally uh, had determined that we had a very concerning FY21 budget, uh, the school department met with the Warren committee subcommittee to the school committee uh, and we looked at our out of district tuitions and our special education lines uh, for years those lines have been uh, historically underfunded until we got the override in 2015 um, and since that time the school committee has worked hard along with the Warren committee to come up with a three year revolving plan to ensure that funds for those lines are always available for our students. Uh, there was a uh, confluence of, uh, of case uh, data that came into play in the last two years where the balance in that three-year plan, uh, we had what we would call the school's free cash for special education out of district services. Um, and we were thoughtful about um, whether or not we needed to ask the town for more money or we could expend more of those dollars out of our out of district plan, uh, which comes from a combination of uh, circuit breaker funding from the state uh, IDEA funding from the federal government, um, lab credits from our lab collaborative, and also the general fund. Uh, so that mix of revenue, um, along with some conservative budgeting over the years, generated enough funds for us to be able to not take uh, more funding from the general budget and essentially give money back to the general fund. So uh, we are in uh, fairly good shape for our out-of-district three-year plan, mm -hmm. um, and we feel that we can move into next year uh, if there are no further cuts from the state uh, with, with some safety. Thank you, Mr. Phelan. Dan Stevens is next. Mr. Stevens. Hi, Dan Stevens, Precinct 4. Um, so public education is very, um, very important to me, um, as you'll see from my later comments now. Um, and I would encourage, um, so, I know that the uh, that Julie Crockett's amendment uh, failed, but um, I don't think that the um, the the board and the um, the people in the committee should really feel like this is a betrayal or um, really a slap in the face. I mean, we we, we are we're all here in this uh, in this town, living here. Um, you know, we're all in this together, and we do understand that these are difficult times. Um, but I would encourage, uh, it, it's entirely possible for the, um, the committees to not really 
um, realize the depth of feeling that exists in the town or the priorities of the people in the town via town meeting members. So I would encourage um, anyone who really wanted the, um, the, uh, that appropriation to pass to, um, to voice that concern by voting against the budget. Um, I mean, it, it was defeated fairly soundly. I think it's fairly clear the budget will pass, but um, that's what I plan to do. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Chris Doyle, you're next, followed by Jill Clark. Uh, thank you, Chris Doyle, Precinct 1. And I um, just wanted to uh, mention a point. Um, it was touched on in different ways, but um, um, I just I wanted to mention it with regard to the main motion on the budget, which is the importance of <clears throat> looking at um, how we deliver services <clears throat> and the funding for those services. And I think it's gonna be important to look at that for every single department um, in the town. Um, the chart was up earlier that we're all painfully familiar with where the school department funding is shown as, as significantly below the state average and significantly below um, the kind of regional um, cohort of towns a subset that um, one might also compare us to. One could do the same chart for each of the other town uh, departments in the town budget. And um, I think it would be um, interesting um, for people to see that um, as we're trying to examine um, you know, solutions over the next few years and also how to think about how to position the um, uh, amount of, a, of an override and how to position how override funds would be distributed. So I just wanna make a point that I, I think it will be important to do a, a lot of analysis across the board in terms of comparing every single department to averages, to their work, the workload relative to and historically compared to other towns. Um, and that's the school department, but also every single other department. So uh, that's just the point I wanted to make. Thank you, Ms. Doyle. Next, Jill Clark, moderator recognizes you. Jill Clark, Precinct 7. Um, I have another question for Superintendent Phelan. Uh, I noticed in the, um, the, in order to put together the budget for the schools, one of the things that was cut to come down to um, the lower amount was custodial overtime. And my guess is that if schools uh, do meet in person in any um, capacity in the fall, that there's likely gonna be considerably increased responsibilities around cleaning and disinfection, um, which is probably going to need a fair amount of custodial overtime. And I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you think that will be addressed. Um, Phelan. John Phelan, Superintendent of Schools. Uh, the uh, work of the facilities department has been amazing throughout this process. Our custodial facility staff have been wonderful. Uh, back in January, when this uh, uh, pandemic began to show its, uh, its face, uh, the school department bought two machines that could actually clean uh, a full school in one night with just two people. Uh, it was a large industrial grade hospital machine uh, on wheels and there was one that was held in a backpack so someone could do the stairwells and someone could do the classrooms. We have since got in line and purchased two more as a town uh, with work uh, done with Jay Marquardt and Patrice Garvin um, in the facilities department. Uh, so we can be able to now pivot and clean our schools quicker with less man hours. Uh, and currently that one machine is cleaning uh, the police department and the fire department. Um, and we believe if we have those types of um, machines and tools that we can do so with less hours. Um, despite the fact that, that those dollars for the custodial overtime is not the entire amount, uh, it is still a concern because we know we will lean on our custodial staff heavily next year. Uh, so that's why th that cut was a hard cut as well. Thank you, Mr. Phelan. Uh, Laurie Slapp, Chair of the Warren Committee. Um, I just wanted to chime in and react to one of the- I, Identify yourself, Laurie. Oh, sorry. Laurie Slap, Chair of the Warren Committee, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 6. I just wanted to respond to a comment that was made a few minutes ago about um, the 
fitness of town meeting members actively debating the budget, which I think is absolutely true. And I would just like to encourage everyone to get involved even earlier in the process. I know the Warren Committee, all the they're all open meetings, and I think we would encourage and welcome um, participation from all town meeting members or all residents earlier in the process. So please get involved as you can. Our moderator recognizes Judy McSwain. Judy, can you unmute your? Judy, are you there? Okay, we'll come back to you, Judy. Uh, Mark Palullo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mark Palillo, town meeting member, precinct eight. Uh, just a couple of brief comments. Uh, first of all, no matter what side of the vote you're on in the amendment, I think you should stand behind this budget because we do need to move together. We need we we do need to move forward together. And uh, you know, we worked really hard. I was on the select board to, to with the understanding that it was uh, one Belmont, one budget. And I think we need to continue to be unified. That the, the elected bodies in town need to continue to work together and approach. This financial crisis, we're absolutely in a financial crisis for the reasons I stated earlier uh, together to, to see if we can address it in the fall and the spring of next year. Uh, I do believe in the understanding within the financial task force, and I didn't get a chance to speak on the, on the amendment, was that you know, we would revisit you know, where we stood from a state aid perspective. I do appreciate Senator Brownsberger's comments, uh, perhaps optimistic that we would be you know, uh, around a 10% cut. Everything I read suggests more, but we'll see, right? Depends on whether there's an uptick, whether there's a vaccine. There's so much, so much uncertainty as he, as he indicated, and we certainly appreciate everything he continues to do for our community. Um, but the idea was that in the fall that we would, we would address clearly the needs within the schools, clearly the needs within the town, clearly the needs from a capital perspective within the 21 budget, and then hopefully come together, all elected bodies working together uh, to stand behind uh, a budget for 22 and stand behind an override um, either this fall or spring. And I believe we were successful in 2015 because of this, you know, when the select board worked with the school committee and, and uh, the administrations worked together and clearly uh, the campaign that was organized around it as well. But we were, we were unified in terms of the messaging, we're unified in terms of the need, and I would just encourage us to continue to work that way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dan Barry, you're next. Hi, Dan Barry, Precinct 1. Um, I'm going to support the, the, the budget, uh, but I do want to thank Julie Crockett for offering uh, the amendment. Um, I actually heard about this issue, the possible school cut of a million dollars, uh, I guess about a month or so ago. I emailed all the select board members and the school committee. They took the actions they did. It was totally their prerogative to do so. Uh, but as town meeting members, I think we had the prerogative to um, you know, discuss that uh, matter tonight. Uh, because it was mentioned a couple of times in the debate about you know, employees taking maybe more of a hit financially, uh, just so we're all, all on the same page, just last November, uh, we talked about the reality that the town uh, made a move to increase health insurance deductibles and co-pays of all town employees uh, to help lower the budget uh, problems that were, you know, for this, actually for this budget. Um, so that's been done. So whether you want to do more or not, that that's up to other people than me, but that's just a fact. Um, and then on a different but related topic to the schools, Minuteman was also discussed last fall. It's been discussed for many years now. Uh, and, and we've been heading towards an exit for Minuteman and it happened in a lot of those debates. Uh, a lot of assurances were given that any Belmont kid who wanted to go to Minuteman probably would be able to do so. It wasn't guaranteed, nothing was carved in stone, but I've talked to some constituents whose kids eighth graders applied to Minuteman this year and didn't get in. And that's disconcerting because all the alternatives to Minuteman that have been put forth by town officials over the years um, are for schools that uh, offer far fewer programs than Minuteman. You know, Minuteman's like 20 or 27 programs and all the alternatives were much less. Um, so I guess if someone could answer the, the question of how many eighth graders uh, got into Minuteman uh, who applied and how many got rejected, um, I'd appreciate knowing that. Um, John Phelan, superintendent of schools. Um, yes, John. 
we got an updated uh, list of students. Uh, there are currently uh, seven rising ninth graders that were allowed to attend Minuteman. Uh, we have uh, hired uh, a liaison on the school side to support students going to Minuteman or Medford or Cambridge. Uh, so we were able to have seven, seven students uh, get into Minuteman. We had about 25 or 30 who were looking to get into Minuteman. So we do have folks on the wait list, uh, not only in ninth grade, but in the other grades as well. Uh, and we have some students going to Medford uh, High School for their technical program. Um, so of, of the 25 or 30 that we're looking to go into a CVTE pathway, uh, right now we have about uh, around 11 to 15 who are looking to be uh, either in Medford or Minuteman. And to answer your question directly, Dan, seven students freshmen at Minuteman this next year. Mike Crowley appreciated that question. Thank you. Uh, Judy McSwain, come back to you. Uh, um, I'm sorry, Mike, I didn't mean to raise my hand. Oh, all right. Thank you, Judy. Um, Arto Asadurian, moderator recognizes you. Arto Asadurian, precinct five, I move the question. Mr. Asadurian has moved the question. Uh, which requires, which would terminate debate on the uh, main motion for the uh, fiscal 21 budget. So let's go right to the vote. So the polls are open, requires two thirds majority to terminate debate. We'll do about 10 more seconds on the voting to terminate debate. All right, let's close the polls. All right, the motion to terminate debate is approved 227 to 19, three abstentions. Ms. Cushman. Good evening, Ellen O'Brien Cushman, town clerk. I have a few emergency votes. Thomasina Olson, precinct five votes yes. Kathy Gahane, precinct two votes yes. Joel Samuels, Precinct 6, votes yes. Suzanne Bloor, Precinct 5, votes yes. Donald Mercier, Precinct 8, votes yes. That is a total addition of one. Five, five yes. So five yes. And uh, we had 227, so that's 232 yes. yes. 19, 19 no, three abstentions. All right, let's go to the next vote, Glenn, on the main motion itself. So now what we're doing is going immediately, since we've terminated debate, on the main motion under Article 9, namely the fiscal 2021 budget, as, and the polls are open.
<laughs> what, 15 seconds? Right, let's close the polls, show the tally. The motion was approved 232 to 15 with two abstentions. Ms. Cushman. Alan O'Brien Cushman, town clerk. Uh, Lynn Reed from precinct eight voted yes. Thomasina Olson, Precinct 5, voted yes. Joel Samuels, Precinct 6, voted yes. That is three yes. So that makes 235 yes votes. So we'll scroll through this very quickly and finish our business. And all of these votes will be available on the town clerk's website. All right, thank you all. Uh, now we'll turn to article 10. We have two CPA articles and then uh, article 12 is just a formality and so we'll be done. Um, Elizabeth Dion, chair of the CPC, will read the motion and make a very brief presentation. Good evening, I'm Elizabeth Dion, Chair of the Community Preservation Committee. Moved that the town reserve for appropriation the following amounts from FY 2021 estimated receipts of $1,300,000 as recommended by the Community Preservation Committee. One, $130,000 for acquisition, creation, and preservation of open space and for recreational use. Two, $130,000 for acquisition, preservation, rehabilitation, and restoration of historic resources. Three, $130,000 for the creation, preservation, and support of community housing. Four, $855,000 to the budget of reserve, and five, $55,000 to be appropriated for the administrative expenses and all other necessary proper expenses of the Community Preservation Committee for FY 2021. And that $125,000 be appropriated from the undesignated fund balance of the Community Preservation Fund for the Town Hall Chimney Repair. Mindful of the late hour, I will try to keep this succinct. Uh, in 2010, Belmont adopted the state's Community Preservation Act, allowing a 1.5% surcharge on the town's property tax levy. These funds are governed by statute, therefore they are not available for our many, many pressing needs. And I raise this because it's a question that came before the Warrant Committee, which I'm also a member. These funds have designated uses, they are not available to plug other budget gap holes. The CPA, allow, the CPA requires appropriations in three project categories with a required minimum of 10% in each. One, open space recreational land, two, historic resources, and three, affordable housing. That explains items one, two, and three on the motion. The CPA also allows for up to 5% of the annual revenue to be used for administrative and operating expenses. That allows for number five. So item four, the $855,000 represents the balance that is left after subtracting uh, the three required appropriations and the administrative funds. CPC initially planned to recommend four projects that went through the regular process of vetting beginning in the fall of 2019. However, tonight we were asked to focus only on critical funding for FY 2021. Uh, so consideration of the three non-critical projects will be postponed to Belmont's next special town meeting whenever that is. The three items are listed below. You can find detailed information on each of them on the CPC's website, which is on the, um, or page on the town's website. Uh, I also recommend that you look there for our annual report, which gives fairly extensive information about what we have done this year. 
one product project we deemed to be critical and asked that it be considered by town meeting. These are the town hall chimneys. Steve Dorrance, Director of Facilities, has requested $125,000 for repair and weatherization of the chimneys on Town Hall. They have sustained significant damage, including long vertical cracks which run through bricks, um, and that has resulted in significant displacement of especially one of the chimneys that I will show you in the slides. Uh, there are also horizontal cracks that run through the mortar. I will not be showing you any of those slides tonight. Uh, but this is a critical project, both for public safety and to prevent possible significant damage to the slate roof of Tan Town Hall. The photos that you're going to see come from an inspection of all three chimneys and a report that was written by Boston Chimney and Tower dated October 4, 2019. The uh, photos that you're going to see focus on the vertical cracks only because those are the most dangerous, but all the cracks, there are many, many other um, areas of necessary repair. Uh, let's see, I think we're... Glenn, I have tried to catch up to you. These slides may not be in the order that I had them. Um, so I'm just going to have Glenn scroll through. You're looking at a total of three chimneys on Town Hall. Uh, can we stop here for a minute? You can see on the left of your screen the significant displacement of uh, the brick. And I believe this is the chimney that is closest to Concord Avenue. It would be over the main entrance to Town Hall. Um, if those bricks were to fall, uh, Frankly, I think someone could die. <laughs> Hence our, our feeling that this is um, a, a critical project that we uh, hope you will agree to um, approve and appropriate funds for tonight. Uh, Glenn, go ahead and just continue with, with the additional cracks for the top of the chimney. Uh, let's see, and then there's one more. Go ahead and go to the last one. And that is the last of the slides. Uh, thank you for your consideration, and the CPC strongly recommends um, favorable action on this motion. Let me um, summarize the votes. The school, uh, the select board, the warrant committee, the capital budget committee, and the community preservation committee all voted unanimously in support of this project, in support of this motion. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll go immediately to a vote. We need to do a roll call vote. So if go to the vote, Glenn, the polls are open. Maybe? No. No. Okay, 15 seconds. Right, let's close the polls, Glenn, and show the tabulation. 238 in favor, no opposition, one abstain. Ms. Cushman, did you want to? I do, thank you. Helen O'Brien Cushman, town clerk, with emergency votes on Article 10. Joel Samuels votes yes, precinct six. Thomasina Olson, Precinct 5, votes yes. Donald Mercier, Precinct 8, votes yes. A total of three adds to the total as shown. So that's 241 in favor, none opposed, one abstention. Great. So let's go now, Glenn, to, uh, let's go through this quickly because it was unanimous. 
All right, let's turn to Article 11. So Article 11, um, Elizabeth Dion will present, read that as well and have a brief presentation. Ms. Dion. Moved that the appropriation under Article 10 of the 2018 Annual Town Meeting of $250,000 is a set aside to the Belmont Housing Trust the creation of affordable housing units be amended to permit the use of such funds by the Belmont Housing Trust for rental assistance programs. I'd like to preface this by saying um, that this is a permissible use of CPA funds per section two of the CPA legislation. I won't read it, but we have, I have put in bold rental assistance below. Uh, if you are curious about how these programs work, uh, feel free to visit the Community Preservation Coalition website for additional information. Uh, this obviously came up very much out of cycle because COVID was uh, unexpected and an emergency. Um, we have an off cycle process for special applications, but there was not time to hold uh, public hearings as required. The original language of the FY 2019 appropriation focused on developing new units. And as we reviewed it, uh, we were not comfortable that it included rental assistance as a permitted use. However, we did determine the town meeting could amend the FY 2019 appropriation to include emergency rental assistance as an allowable use. Um, and let's skip one to the next slide. So I'm not going to go through all the program details. I hope that you were able either to hear the presentation of the League of Women Voters or to read the proposal that's included in the report that each of you should have received from the CPC. A few highlights. Uh, first of all, to point out, we are not appropriating new money. We are simply expanding the allowed uses of money that had been previously appropriated. Uh, the top bullet point, um, Glenn, I think you've gotten ahead of me. Can you go back? One, thank you. The top bullet point, eligible, and eligible applicants must prove loss of income due to pandemic, have household income less than 80% of the adjusted median income and priority to households with less than 60% of AMI. Um, and then the fourth bullet point, that the payment amounts would be 50% of HUD established fair market rent for Belmont based on the number of bedrooms. Okay, proceed to the next slide. Uh, this is limited to current Belmont renters, so it is not available to someone who moves into the community. Um, the chart presents what the various income limits are. I'm not going to go over those in detail right now. Uh, and the final bullet point, and I think this is important to note, that applicants must certify that they do not have access to other resources to cover the rent. So if someone has uh, received funds from other sources, uh, that should be taken into account. Local needs and benefits. Um, I want to drop down to the fourth bullet point. Um, actually, third bullet point. The program we think will assist approximately 60 to 80 renter households. Uh, I assume there's going to be more need than that. Uh, this will be set up by a lottery system. Um, on the one hand, I wish we could help more people. On the other hand, I feel comfortable that this is going to help a fair number of people. Uh, and then proceeding to the fourth bullet point, this does get money back into the local economy. Uh, by helping renters, we also help landlords who predominantly are small property holders in Belmont. Uh, and frankly, if uh, their tenants are paying rent, then their likelihood of being able to pay their property taxes to the town also goes up. So I do feel that this provides valuable stimulus to the local economy while meeting a genuine need. Uh, then finally, nearby towns that are starting similar programs include Newton, Lexington, Sudbury, Bedford, and Weston. Next slide. Program details. Um, this will only provide three months of rental payment support. That's just our best guess based on the allocation of um, spaces and the amount that will be needed. Uh, I think that's how long it'll last. Uh, both eligible applicants and their landlords are required to sign a participation agreement. Um, the uh, fourth bullet point, there will be intensive marketing efforts to make sure that Belmont residents are aware of this opportunity. And finally, as we've mentioned, there'll be a lottery. And then um, we've not included this slide, but program administration will be 
by an experienced local nonprofit housing agency that administers these types of programs. Belmont is not going, we, we do not have the expertise in-house to administer this, but there are programs that do this. They are um, experienced in the application process and getting the certifications they need and verifying incomes. Uh, and then the final slide, or is that our final slide, Glenn? It's a okay, let's leave it at that then. Uh, so again, the, the Community Preservation Committee feels that this is a worthwhile um, use of funds and strongly recommends it. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, the votes on this, the select board, the um, Capital Budget Committee and the Community Preservation Committee all voted unanimously in support the warrant committee voted 14 yes and one opposed. And as it turns out, the first speaker will be Bob McLaughlin, who is the vote on the warrant committee in opposition. Mr. McLaughlin. Uh, Mr. Moderator, Bob McLaughlin, precinct two. Uh, and yes, I'm the outlier. I'm the one that voted against it. Uh, the lateness of the hour, my remarks would be briefer than I originally intended. But there's three reasons. First of all, I'm not convinced that there really is this problem or people who can't, perhaps maybe don't want to, but can't pay their rent. Um, anybody in this demographics who's lost their job at unemployment is receiving about half of what they would earn. But in addition to that, they get an extra $600 every week, uh, which really means that they are taking home as much as they would have to do the arithmetic um, uh, before they had lost their job. In addition to that, they had the $1,200 uh, supplement from the federal government, $2,400 if it's a married couple, $500 for each child. So that the problem is being addressed at the federal level where they can print money and, and Belmont can't. And as a matter of fact, there is a, a growing awareness that the gov federal government may have overshot the mark in making life too comfortable for these people when they're being called upon to come back to work. They're in fact better off in the situation they are. I'm not sure there's a problem. Second of all, 2018, after some number of years of sputtering and not really having any success in producing uh, low and or affordable housing, the housing trust came in uh, to town meeting with uh, a very convincing argument. Uh, they have to seize an opportunity when it's there, when there's a developer that needs some help, or when there's a mortgage that has to be written down to uh, bring about affordable housing. There's no time to wait for a town meeting to get a specific uh, appropriation. They needed a slush fund. I spoke in favor of the slush fund. Uh, and now, uh, and it, the whole purpose of it was to jumpstart and create permanent uh, affordable housing. They now want to sacrifice that program uh, and, and they want to throw that away. Uh, and at a time when we need it the most, um, we need to get to the 10% more affordable housing in order to have protection against the 40B proceeding. We see what's happening up in Petra Circle, but they want to postpone that program completely uh, and, and use the money what it, from what it was originally intended and, um, uh, and spend it uh, for a problem that, as I said in the beginning, I'm not sure anything. Third, I don't like the optics. Uh, I don't know how many times tonight I've heard the word override. We're going to have an override. Don't think it is a slam dunk. Uh, I, the people who uh, we are all talking to ourselves with, who are preaching to the choir, there is a great amount of resistance out there to the tax rate in Belmont. There's going to be an opposition. Don't give them a sound bite that we just gave away a quarter of a million dollars. In fact, had to pay Twenty-four to $36,000 to see how we could pay it and give, give it away. Uh, it's late. Let me just say this. Uh, the, the housing trust heart is absolutely in the right place. Uh, they had no success with their first um, home buyer program and so forth. But now they seem to have, since 2018 town meeting, the ability to maybe create some permanent housing. And as I say, they, they are throwing that away. 
Uh, those of us who want to see permanent low-income housing. Mr. McLaughlin, we're at the three-minute mark. Could you wind up? I'll end. I'll end. I, I hope you see you should vote no, and it'll bring about permanent housing. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Uh, Michael McNamara, you're next. Michael McNamara, town meeting member, Precinct 7. This is an unprecedented crisis we have um, with uh, housing in Belmont. Uh, seniors often are people who are disproportionately on fixed incomes. They maybe they own their house, maybe they're renters, you know, they, they downsized and now they're trying to pay their rent and they're failing out the government and state government and us are all looking for cuts. So I feel like in such an immediate and urgent crisis as COVID-19, along with the financial crash, which we had not more than like 10 years ago, and people are still barely surviving, barely coming back after that. I feel like it, it's such a small amount of money to do so much good for people who are really on the bottom of the barrel. We know that in people in Belmont, there are a lot of people who are very fortunate, myself included. I'm sure a lot of people in town meeting are very fortunate. But we can clearly see that from, if you go and wait in the food line, if you like look at the um, assistance program for people who are need food assistance in Belmont, there are people who need that help. There are people who are really desperate and, and really in need and are looking for some help. They're not looking for a handout, they're looking for some help to be able to afford their bills, to be able to stay in their home. And I think the least we can do in such an urgent crisis where people are dying and people are barely struggling to make it by and governments are continually cutting and cutting resources to these groups, the least we can do is make sure people can stay in their home. So I understand the need for urgency. I understand the need for a focus on the override, but we can't sacrifice our souls in order to pass the override. We need to understand that the override is meant to help people, but it's also meant overall to provide a service to the town. The town provides services and we can't leave people out in the cold. Thank you. Julie Wu is next, followed by Jack Weiss. Ms. Wu. This is Julie Wu of uh, Precinct 6. I just wanted to say that I've been volunteering for Belmont Helps and talking to a lot of people in need in this community, including a couple of people who have been requesting rental assistance um, who, do, who, do not, who do not um, receive any, um, any assistance from the government and would benefit from this, pro, uh, this uh, program. So I uh, will be voting in favor of this motion. Thank you, Jack Weiss, recognize you. Jack Weiss, uh, Precinct One. Um, I uh, often am in agreement with Bob McLaughlin uh, on this issue, I disagree. Um, I do think um, with a 20 plus percent unemployment rate, there is a need in the community. If Bob is correct that there isn't, then that will be borne out uh, during the uh, application and review process when the administrative agency will look to see whether or not there is a need. I frankly would anticipate that there is, um, but if there isn't, uh, the funds won't be spent uh, cavalierly. Um, I do think it's unfortunate that um, the money isn't going to housing creation, uh, which addresses the uh, uh, meeting the affordability requirement, but this is um, a generational um, economic event, um, and I applaud the Housing Trust for pivoting to address a need in the community, and so I would urge everybody to vote yes. Thank you, Jack. Alexandra Van Deel. Hi, thank you. Um, Alex Van Geel from Precinct 7. I have a a question about, um, I was wondering whether it was possible in connection with this program to expand it to allow um, potential donations from the community um, in addition to whatever monies you already have. Uh, I am not a member of the Housing Trust, but my understanding That's is Elizabeth. that they can you identify? All right, yourself? yes, thank you. Elizabeth Dion, town meeting, uh, precinct two, chair of the community preservation committee. Uh, my understanding is that the housing trust does plan to seek additional donations. From, from private parties, you mean? Yes, from private parties. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
uh, Mark Wagner. Mark Wagner, Precinct 5. Um, I'm a little troubled by what I saw in one of the earlier slides that said something to the effect that other uh, towns are starting programs like this. And I think it would be helpful if we heard directly from someone uh, in, in the Housing Trust to let us know whether this is a pivot in the mission of the Housing Trust towards rental assistance away from the creation of affordable housing in general, or is this a one-time pandemic related uh, redirection. I'm a little troubled by the fact that we haven't heard anyone from the Housing Trust on this issue. Uh, this is Elizabeth Dion again, um, Town Meeting Precinct 2, Chair of the Community Preservation Committee. Um, I'd like to speak to the larger point again. Um, I, I've got Rachel Heller, I hope, on call who can at some point in some way contact if, if, uh, if I misspeak. But we are not in any way moving away from a mission of producing more affordable housing units. Um, if I thought this was an either or, I would have to agree with Bob that I would be very reluctant to uh, expand the use of this to fund emergency rental assistance. But we have funded a study of Sherman Gardens and one of the projects that we're going to ask town meeting to approve and appropriate funds for is to expand that study to include Belmont Village, the idea being that potentially we don't just rehabilitate those units, but expand the number. Um, but this is going to be several years in the planning, and it is going to take a few years for the Community Preservation Committee to um, assemble the funds that are going to be needed to then leverage state and federal grants. So I think everybody agrees that the long-term goal is to increase the affordable housing stock that is not going to happen in the next three or four months. Uh, I at least am confident that this use of these funds right now will not preclude future planning. Um, I think these funds would otherwise just remain parked during the period of time that we're talking about. Um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, excuse me, I think we have Rachel Heller on. Wonderful, here. thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Rachel, are you? I am, hi. Rachel Heller, co-chair of the Housing Trust. And thank you everybody for speaking up about the need for more housing. That is something that the Housing Trust is intensely focused on, um, as is evidenced by the work that we've been doing over the last year and a half around the McLean development proposal, which hopefully will be before town meeting uh, in November. Um, we remain very focused, as I said, on creating additional housing the reason why we pivoted at this point really is the emergency. The problem is real. Um, unemployment, the enhanced unemployment that Bob spoke about does end on July 31st. That is very close to when the eviction moratorium in our state will end. That's expected in mid August. And we know that um, before the pandemic, we had more than 700 households in Belmont who earn less than 80% of the area median income and we're paying more than half of their income towards rent. That was before the pandemic. That is considered extremely rent burdened and any emergency could throw a household you know, out of their housing at that point. So this really was a response to the emergency. Um, and just one more thing about Bob's point about federal funds. You're absolutely right. We should have more federal dollars. There are federal dollars coming to Massachusetts for rental assistance. It's not enough. There's state funds going to rental assistance it's not enough. And so there's actually a lot of communities around the state that are trying to supplement that and help to provide the safety net that people need right now. Thank you, Ms. Heller. Um, Heather you. Raveski, you're next. Heather Raveski, Precinct 7. Sorry, I don't know if I unmuted the first time. Heather Raveski, Precinct 7. If by some chance, um, Bob is correct and there are not enough people who need assistance. What happens to the rest of the funds? Mr. Elizabeth Dion, uh, Town Meeting Precinct 2, Chair of the Community Preservation Committee. 
Those funds uh, would not be expended by the Housing Trust. George Hall may need to confirm this, but my assumption is because they've not been expended, they remain in the original account. So the money will only be released as it's used and we're still maintaining the original uh, uses in the original appropriation. So if those monies are not used for rental assistance then they should still be available for affordable housing development. Thank you. David Powellstock, you're next. Hi, uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. David Powell, Stock Precinct 4. I would like to call the question. Mr. Powell, Stock has called the question. This takes two thirds. Can we get uh, plan? Can we get a vote to terminate debate? All those in favor of terminating debate, the polls are open. Vote yes. If you oppose, vote no. Fifteen seconds. All right, let's close the polling, Glenn, and show the results. Motion to terminate debate, 217 in favor, 15 opposed, no abstentions. Ms. Cushman. Mr. Moderator, Ellen O'Brien Cushman, town clerk. The emergency vote line has again reported. This time, Fred Paulson, precinct one, has voted yes. Thomasina Olson, precinct five, has voted yes. Joel Samuels, precinct six, has voted yes. Don Mercier, Precinct 8 has voted yes, a total of four yes additions. We had 217, so it was 221 in favor. Sorry, 221 in favor, 15 opposed. No abstention. So now um, let's go directly to the Main motion under Article 11. So this is the the motion itself. We terminate debate, of course. So if you support the motion for the Belmont Housing Trust, vote aye. If you don't, vote no. So is the polls are open. Okay. 
So 15 seconds more on the voting. All right, let's close the poll. Glenn, can you show the tally? Of the motion under article 205 in favor, 26 opposed, three abstentions. And Ms. Cushman? Ellen O'Brien Cushman, town clerk. I'm reporting the emergency votes that came in. Uh, Suzanne Bloor, precinct five, voted yes. Donald Mercier, Precinct 8, voted no. Thomasina Olson, Precinct 5, voted yes. Joel Samuels, Precinct 6, voted yes. Fred Paulson, Precinct 1, voted yes. So that's a total of four additional yes, one additional no. So the final tally then is 209 yes. 27 no, three abstentions. All right, so now let's um, go to article 12. This is a formality. We put this uh, by way of explanation, we put this on the warrant in case the legislature did not act. They have acted, but we thought it was uh, appropriate to make ironclad sure that the town meeting supported the remote participation. So here I will read home rule petition for special act of the Massachusetts legislature, remote participation of town meeting, move that the select board be authorized to petition the Massachusetts general court for legislation providing that notwithstanding the provisions of any general or special law or town bylaw to the contrary, all acts and proceedings taken by the, by the town at any annual or special town meeting held by remote participation by electronic means between June 16 and September 30, 2020, and all actions taken pursuant thereto are ratified, validated, and confirmed to the same extent as if the said annual or special town meeting had been held in a physical, physical location and in full compliance with any applicable general or special law or bylaw. The select board voted unanimously. The warrant committee voted unanimously in support. Let's go directly to a roll call vote, which we need for the record. So the polls are open. While you're voting, let me say thank you. A big, big thank you. First to all of you for staying through. We still have well more than 200 town meeting members here. But a special thank you to the crew who put all of this together and did an unbelievable job. Town clerk, IT, Belmont Media, the uh, town administrative staff, the uh, town council. This was a huge team effort took unbelievable amount of time. I'm frankly thrilled that we did this in one night. We set a pattern for the Commonwealth with a handful of other communities in doing this. We had good debate tonight. A big thank you to everybody. And the vote, uh, another 15 seconds. All right, let's close the polls. Vote is 232 in favor, nobody opposed, one abstention. Ms. Cushman. I believe for the final time, Ellen O'Brien Cushman, town clerk, 
reporting the emergency votes. And I would have to say, if you don't mind, I thank very much the emergency vote team who did an awesome job in addition to all those other people, they're unsung heroes. Uh, Thomasina Olson, precinct five voted yes. Fred Paulson, precinct one voted yes. Joel Samuels, precinct six voted yes. That's three yes in addition to the reported result. So that's 230, that's 235 in favor. No one opposed, one abstention. Great, so now we go to the final, the final uh, Slide, move that the annual town meeting be dissolved. Uh, I will accept unanimous consent that this motion is adopted unless anybody wants to uh, raise their hand. Seeing none, the annual, the 2000, 2020 Belmont annual town meeting is dissolved. A big thank you to everybody.